Shut up and sit down. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast brought to you by Tacticam. Tacticam is by far the easiest way to begin filming your hunts. Whether it's the budget-friendly Solo or the 4K Tacticam 5.0, there's something for everyone. So you can check them out at Tacticam.com. This is nearly the longest podcast that we've ever had. Um, I'm going to keep this short. Uh, This one is John and his buddy Eddie. Uh, along with myself, uh, going over John's hunts from Montana. And um, (laughs) a lot of ups and downs, a lot of trials and tribulations, lots of laughs. I know you guys are going to love this one. If you are one of our Patreons, um, I've got uh, all of the Patreon winners stuff uh, shipped out, so those will be on their way to you. Uh, this quarter for our patrons, we'll be giving away a, a pack, and we're going to be giving away some Badlands rain gear. Um, so I did a poll, and uh, some of the things that people did not purchase because of cost uh, was a pack. Um, because of availability right now, I'm not sure which pack we're going to be giving away. I'm actually looking towards maybe the Mystery Ranch Metcalf. Um, but I know that they don't have the guide lids uh, in stock. They don't have the lids for those because uh, I want one for my sawtooth. So I'm not going to commit to which one's available. The XOs are almost impossible to get, um, you, know, you know, things like that. So um, we're going to be giving away a pack, uh, some Badlands rain gear, and um, the base map uh, package. So... Um, if you want to know what Patreon is, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Bowhunter Chronicles podcast, or you can go to just the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast.com and check out the Patreon link. But basically, uh, it's a crowdfunding deal that, uh, you know, puts a donation uh, in our account every month uh, as appreciation for what we do. We take most of that money, we do giveaways, and give back to. Uh, those people that support us, uh, plain and simple. Uh, but it does help with travel costs and uh, video equipment, podcasting equipment, and things like that. So uh, if you want to check that out, patreon.com forward slash Bowhunter Chronicles podcast. It means the world to us that people care uh, enough to support us. But um, anyways, super long podcast. So um, I'm going to get right to it. I know you guys are going to like this one. You guys have been waiting for John to open up, do some talking, and he does just that on this one. So, enjoy the podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast. We are going to have a very special guest on here. We actually do have a guest on the line, uh, but today you're going to hear from none other than the co-host founder of the bow hunter chronicles john borsma uh, we're hoping to get a few words out of him uh this evening we're going to go through his uh hunt across montana i guess we're going to call it uh from one side to the other and um so how are you doing tonight john i'm doing well and then who do we have on the line john so tonight we have my buddy from from bozeman montana who i hunted with pretty much the whole time eddie bullock how you doing tonight, Ed? Hey, I'm doing well. Nice to be here. <laughs> so, uh, why don't we give people a little background on on you, Ed? Like where you grew up, what your hunting background is, you know, your archery background, and all that, and how you end up out west. Oh my goodness! Grew up in good old Twin Lake, Michigan. <laughs> Wouldn't trade trade that grow up area for anything. Hunted right in the backyard of the parents' property. You know, shot many a white tails. First white tail with a good old bear, forty-five pound recurve. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> a dandy. Yep. <laughs> sure thought I was a big, big hunter until I moved out west. <laughs> and uh, the mountains and the elk—they're a lot different than hunting white tails. <laughs> I'll just tell you that. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. <clears throat> so. Something led me out west was a, a career path or change. And then once I got out into the western United States, I didn't want to live anywhere but there. <laughs> Michigan is a great place to live and 
a lot of beautiful, wonderful things there. But boy, it just, it's just something about the mountains that draw, drawn me here and kept me here. Well, yeah, I get that too, man. When I was out there, it's just like being able to look out and look around them every in every direction to see every different range and the snow on the mountains and man i miss it already well i missed it as soon as i pulled out oh yeah so there there is a little bit you, your archery background now i mean like when you were telling me about this a couple of years ago like you actually shot redding and all that so why don't you give me a little bit of that information oh yeah well you know yeah, I learned from my dad to shoot archery, you know, and and he did well, you know, successful, filled the freezer and things like that, and and I tried to follow in his footsteps and do all the right things, but I did find myself maybe not as prepared as I thought I should be for, you know, going out and taking an animal with your bow, so I joined a a uh, couple of archery clubs when I moved to Montana just to become a better bow hunter. You know, I just wanted to learn more and and practice more and just be um, more responsible about going out into the woods and taking an animal. And so that kind of got me sucked in. A bunch of people at the archery club were, you know, really I just kind of got drawn into all the practicing and all the details of the bow and learning how to work on your own equipment and stuff I'd never even thought about in my early days. You know, I just didn't even, you know, you just shot 20 yards and out of your tree stand was great, but there there turned out to be, there was a lot more to it. So then I got to be shooting quite a bit and got pretty good. And a few guys that I shot with, you know, thought, well, why don't you shoot these state shoots? You know, there's 3D tournament. We had a Vegas tournament and a five-spot tournament. And pretty soon I was doing that and placing really well, bringing home state trophies for shooting those things. And, and I had a friend of mine that I was shooting with, and he had shot Redding, California before, the big shoot out there. And I had never even heard of I didn't even know these things went on, you know, growing up in the Michigan and maybe I was a little sheltered that way, but <laughs> I didn't had no idea these kind of events went on and um we went there I can't I think it was probably nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight and shot and um did pretty well and I think went back the next year is when I shot the tournament and ended up getting most of the way through the tournament and doing pretty well. And I was actually kind of ahead of my mentor in the scoring and got down to, I don't know, one of the last three targets might've been a 70 yard moose shot and noticed my limbs. One of my limbs on my bow was delaminating (laughs) and I, I didn't even know, I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know what the consequences of something like that could be. You know, just kind of like, oh, okay, it's coming apart a little bit. But my friend Dennis, he's like, oh, don't worry about that stuff. It's no problem. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I just keep shooting, end up, I don't know where I was. I think, I can't remember what the scoring system was then, but maybe a 1580 or something like that. And I don't remember what the total points were, but. I was like, oh, great, I did pretty good, you know. And he's like, no, you did better than pretty good. You should take that scorecard and march right over there to the the bow company at the bow I had I was shooting. It was a Blue Mountain bow. And you should present that to him and tell him you'd like to get sponsored. And I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I did that. And sure enough, they, they just snapped me right up and sponsored me as a shooter. So I shot and they gave me a couple bows. And I shot for them for a couple of years, went to some other tournaments, did pretty good, went to Vegas, got my butt handed to me there. <laughs> he, little big fish in a little, little pond does good, but go down to the big pond, you turn into a real little fish. <laughs> uh, the nerves got to me. It was just, a, it was fun though. And 
traveled to Minnesota to Detroit Lakes and did a big shoot over in Idaho and it was a lot of fun. It really turned me into a lot better, more responsible hunter with my bow. So I was pretty dang exciting. I think you mentioned before, did you didn't you even like uh like get meet like the the wilds? Like Rio Wilds oh, dad. Yeah, D Wild. I ended up well after I, I ended up shooting for um got a sponsorship um from Martin Archery as well. And I shot for them for one year and then then I transitioned to Colorado and my life kinda changed around there and I kinda got out of shooting for a while. But yeah, D Wild, I met his son I can't remember his son's name when I lived in Idaho. We ran a bow shop down there. Great people. Shot with D Wild at some of these shoots. He's a fantastic person. A guy that didn't get into competition shooting, even archery till I think in his forties. I'm I might I wouldn't quote me on that, but late in life. And he was one of the best shooters that I know of in my time, you know. I'm sure there's a lot of guys out there now, but incredible shooter. Great man too. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, when you were telling me that, I'm like, really? You you shot Redding? You met, you know, and you're hanging out with like D Wild, or you know, it's like yeah, man, the, some... the 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 archery shop in Helena, Montana. The people who ran it at the time, they shot Martin Bows, and they knew him personally. They had they the guy had a son and a daughter that were incredible shooters. I think the daughter went on to do more, um, but. Yeah, they were great in getting me sponsored by Martin Archery. It was a wonderful thing. I wish I would have kind of, looking back, maybe pursued more, you know, more competition and stuff. But just life takes you in different directions. Yeah, that's for sure. And it's never too late to, you know, get back into that either. And right. speaking of that, just getting a new bow this year and getting more fired up, it's gotten me all excited. Ordered a big, huge new you know, practice target, and I got a whole bunch of five spots and Vegas spots, a hundred hundred pack of each. I'm I'm going to be shooting the heck out of them this this winter in my shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, shoot, I got out there when I showed up at the property at your house. There, you had a whole 3D range set up. I mean, <laughs> you had bear and elk and deer, and I don't know what else, man. All kinds of stuff. coyote, coyote, and coyote and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, it, I think it's a real good thing to kind of. Try to shoot at what you're going to shoot at. You know? Gives yeah. you a little more perspective. Yeah, I wish I would have been shooting more at the elk. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Before before we get into the the elk talk, John. So you, you headed out, and what was your plan going out hunting? And then how did it all? I guess did the way that it was going to go in your mind, the way that you set out your plan. You know, not necessarily the successes and failures, the highs and the lows, because there was all of that. Oh, for sure. Um, well, so I originally planned on like heading out. Like, um, I think Ed, you worked. You had to work up until Friday. Friday the twelfth, I think. Yeah, and so of we September, were September. Yeah, we were originally, you know, like I was planning on heading out there around the twelfth. I think that's you know from the the get go is the twelfth, and then. I was planning on like picking a couple spots or just getting to Eastern Montana and then, you know, finding some BLM and trying to uh, get some stocks down on an antelope. So I ended up leaving, I ended up leaving on Wednesday. So that was like the 11th or the 10th. Ended up taking the boat across in the morning, got over there. So that saved me like four and a half hours of driving. And then I drove straight through and got into a, uh, Eastern Montana about 2, 3 a.m. Ended up staying in a little town. Glendive, I think is the name of it. Is that the name of the town over there, Ed? Glendive? Yeah, that's the name of a town. Yeah. <laughs> I think you might have stayed there. You probably, about all they had was a place you could get some chapstick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I would have thought of it at that time, I should have got some chapstick at that gas station. But <laughs> there was, a, I remember there was a little motel but i just pulled in the motel parking lot and slept in my truck because i was only going to sleep for a couple hours so i slept for a couple hours and i was trying to you know make sure my maps were downloaded and everything which and then oh i was trying to set up my garmin because i had per 
picked up an inReach right before, like the day before I left. And of course, you know, my wife's like, well, have it set up so I can, you know, make sure that you're okay. Because, you know, anyway. So I get out there. I'm thinking around that. Finally, I get a couple hours sleep, get up, go down to the little gas station there, get a coffee and some donuts. And I take off. And I, I think I had like another half hour, 40 minutes to go where I'd pick this spot. And that sounds like the food of champions right there, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely. Uh, donuts. <laughs> definitely uh, give you a, you know, good good energy boost in the morning, especially after a long drive and a couple hours of sleep. So <laughs> I get over to this spot and ended up, I picked out like this big section of BLM on the, uh, like the north side of uh, 94 there. And I had no idea, you know, I'm just assuming that there's going to be antelope there. Like I'm hoping there. <clears throat> and uh, at first when I got like the first probably mile or so of it, it looked like the Badlands. Like it was actually mountainous. Like, like man, this, this looks more like elk country, not antelope. But as you get out there, you kind of climb up and you get up and it's a, like a big plateau on the top. So then it was just all, you know, like perfect looking antelope country. So I start driving and driving. All of a sudden, sure enough, right right away or right off the bat, I see a buck and a doe standing right off the side of the road. So I'm like, oh, sweet, there's some antelope in here. So I drive up the road a little farther. I get to the edge of the BLM and the private. So I turn around, come back. They had kind of moved off. So I'd circled around trying to see if I could get like kind of to the northwest of where they were heading and ended up the, the two track in the BLM and ended before like it wasn't going to work out. So I drove back, drove back down. And then I ended up heading back to the North again, to the other end of the, the BLM and private. And I seen another nice buck stand on the ridge by himself over to the, towards the East. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go after him. So I'm still in my street clothes and everything. So I get down, I hurry up. I'm trying to find like my tactic cam and all the stuff. I'm going through the shit and Finally, I'm just like, screw it. I'm just going to run out there and just try to see if I can find this antelope real quick. Well, and it was cold. Like, it was nice and it was nice and chilly in the morning. So I put on my base layer. I put on my, my, uh, hex suit, then my regular pants and then a sweatshirt and all that. And my bino harness. I didn't bring any water. I didn't have anything else. I didn't bring the, Garmin with me. All I had was my phone, <laughs> and I take off. And I think at one point, actually, it was I never did see that that lone buck, where I you know didn't see him at first. And I but I got out there when the sun come up, and I was you know I'm sitting on top of this little ridge over this like big valley, and just beautiful, you know. So I ended up texting Adam, I'm like send him some pictures, and then I was just getting ready to head back and. I head back to the truck. And I start heading back. Well, out in that BLM, there's like some spots where they have like little, uh, they're almost like a little feed pen that they set up. They put up like a little corral and then they're, they must throw bales of hay or something in it. And I look down by one, I'm, I'm heading back and I look and there's a doe antelope standing right down. By. So I like duck down. I'm like, I'm taking some pictures. I'm sending them to Adam and, uh, well, she ends up walking like to the southeast down this drainage. So I'm like, well, I guess I'll just follow her for a minute, you know, and just see what, you know. So I let her go for a while and I start following her and following. And it's like, man, I'm walking and walking. And finally I get down towards the end of this drainage and I spot a whole herd of them. And they're all just kind of piled up and they're on the other side. So I'm like, man, sweet, there's a whole bunch of them there. And the bucks are just chasing the other does. And it's just, you know, freaking chaos. It's like what you see on, you know, National Geographic or whatever the hunt shows. They're just all over. So I'm trying to put a plan together. And all of a sudden I look and about 300 yards down to the west on the top of that other, this other, the other side of that drainage, there's a, a nice single buck. And he's like walking right towards me, but there's like a a hump in between us out on that, on that drainage. And 
he starts coming my way. Well, then I dis- he disappears. I'm like, well, is he going to the right or the left? So I go to the left. Well, he went to the right. So I finally figured out, well, he's not coming this way. So I went, I start crawling around the other side and end up seeing him. He was down in the bottom of it. And when I say drainage, it's like old creek bottom, but it's completely dried up. It is a little bit greener down in the bottom. And he was just kind of milling around through that. So I'm like, well, I have my antelope decoy. It's the the one that's like the umbrella. Pop it up. So I'm like, well, I'm going to pop it up and just see what he does, you know. So I pop it up and I kind of wiggle a little bit. And sure enough, he like turns right around, looks right at it. He starts walking my way. Well, so he starts walking my way. Well, then I'm like, well, he's going to come my way. Either he's going to come up over the hill here or he's going to circle, you know, down around this way. Well, he just, he did the exact opposite of, he, you know, didn't follow the book at all. <laughs> he disappeared. So I'm sitting there waiting and waiting. All of a sudden, what he did do is he circled all the way to my right around the, the other side of the mound and come up behind me downwind. So, you know, all of a sudden he pops out. I've, and I did get a little bit of video with my phone on that one, but it's like horrible. Like you can barely see it. It's so shaky. And, but so he ended up, I point the decoy at him and he's like sitting there and he's walking back and forth and they're doing, he's doing their bark, whatever they, that noise is it's like kind of like a white tail blow, but it doesn't sound the same. But anyway, so he dinks around a little bit, then finally decides he goes up and over the hill. So at that point, I just take off running and up, run up that hill and get up there. And I'm looking like where he, you know, the direction he took off. Of course, he's all the way to the right. Like stand there on another mound about a hundred yards away, and then then he takes off like to the next county. He's like, "Yeah, screw you, buddy." So I go back, I look, and I can still see the whole other herd still down at the end. So, but they're on the other side, and there's no way I can get to them on the side I'm on. So I end up going back down. I get down to the bottom of that drainage. I got to crawl all the way across this, and it's like a couple hundred yards. And now it's getting warm out. You know, it's been <laughs> like a couple hours. The sun's hot, getting higher. And I'm like, man, I wish I would have brought some water. You know, my lips are dry. So, <laughs> and it's getting like, so, so you probably you probably didn't do any crawling prep in all your hunting prep. Then. No, and that was the other thing. It's like, you know what? <laughs> I did not. I didn't do any crawling prep. And my freaking neck, you know, like when you're trying to crawl and look, it's like, for the whole next, like the next day, I'm like, man, my neck. I didn't even, I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm not even hunting tomorrow <laughs> or, or today, <laughs> the next day. But anyway, so yeah, I crawl across that part of the drainage. I get to the other side and I start side hilling. And of course it's all, out. at one point there was like some shrubs and stuff. So I like, and it was like nice shadowy spot. So I like lay down in that. I'm like, oh, it's nice and cool right here. And so then I keep watching there. I mean, these antelope are just like, there's three little bucks and they kind of milled out like 200 yards off to my left. And then the main groups down to the right. Then I see the two big bucks just going at it. I mean, just fighting the one knocks the other one down and finally just chases them all the way across this drainage, all the way across this, the bottom, all the way up to the other, other side of the meadow. I mean, like several hundred yards, like, so then he can't, he starts coming back. Well, I'm like, man, I got to get down. So I ended up, there was like a little bit of a depression right in front of me. So I start crawling down that to get down to the center of the, the drainage. And, and it's like kind of brushy, like just that open meadow, just gnarly stuff. You know I mean? I didn't find any bad cactuses or anything like I did when I was doing this with Ed, but. So I crawl, I'm crawling my, at this point I had the sweatshirt off, but it was tied around my waist. So that stuff's hanging up. I got my bino harness still, you know, and that's, I'm dragging that. I'm laying on my bow. I did end up like breaking one of the ribs of my decoy, the umbrella, because I like laid on that at one point or crawled on it or something. And so I ended up crawling like another 300 yards. And this has taken me like hours. 
And I finally get down to the very, like, this bend in the freaking drainage. And I can't go any farther. It's like, I'm looking down it. And down at the next bend is the whole herd. Like, all the, the does are just bedded. The buck's still in there just chasing anyone that gets up. And the three other, uh, the like, the little bucks were out off to my left still. I'm like, well, I can't get any farther, so I'm just going to try it. So I popped the decoy up, I stood it up, and then I, like, ranged, like, right in front of me there was a bush, and the bush was 35 yards. The next bush past it was 60 yards, so I'm like, okay, I kind of got my reference point. And I, I'm not kidding you, I, like, took that decoy, and I just, like, head bobbed it a little bit, and that, the, the big buck, like he, it caught his eye and he turned and ran for the first 50 yards, like right at me, like beeline. And I'm like, at this point, I'm, holy shit, it's working. Like, and I'm <laughs> freaking shaking that, you know, I'm like, oh man, I'm going to get a shot. I'm going to kill him. And so he st- starts slowing down. He kind of stops. I shake, do like the head shake again. And he just starts walking right to me. And so I draw back and he was kind of veering. So off to the left of my target or left of my decoy. So I'm set up on the left side or for the left side and I'm drawn back. And then he takes like a step to the right. It's like, sh- and he stops right on top of the bush at 35 yards. And I'm like, so I, I'm like lean. So now I can't like shuffle. I have to lean my body all the way over to the right side so I can get a clear shot. And when I did, I didn't realize it, but there's like some brush and crap down, you know, that I'm kneeling in and it like must've got into the, my cam or I got the cam into it. And when I, and I put the, I put my five pins directly up his brisket. He, he was facing me, which is a risky shot, 35 yards frontal, but I'm like, it's an antelope and they're not as tough as all the rest of the animals, what they say. So <laughs> I put them right and I put my 40 yard pin like right in the center of his brisket and squeezed and I watched my arrow do like a freaking corkscrew and when it hit it hit him like going sideways so I don't it was like the cam just everything that was going on I don't know if I did something when I was crawling but it hit him and it just the fur just flew off him like like I had someone hit it, opened a pillow up, you know, <laughs> and he, it, it almost looked like the arrow slapped him in the face, like the, the fletchings hit him in the face and he took off running and turned, he like got out about a hundred yards, turned and just looked at me like, what the hell was that? You know, wow. <laughs> What'd she just do to me? You know, he had no clue. The whole rest of them, they just kind of sat there and looked at me too, or looked at my way. And I just knocked another arrow, freaking grabbed the decoy and I just started walking towards them. Well, they never really spooked. They just kept their hundred yard distance or 130 or whatever it was. They just, and even, you know, and I, I did that for, until I got up to that, the next bend where they actually were bedded. And even then after that, I turned around and started walking back. And at this point I'm freaking beat. Like my lips are freaking sunburnt and cracked. I'm dehydrated and it's hotter than, Hades down there there's like no breeze matter of fact I had like I had a sunburn strip between my where my shirt got pulled up when I was crawling <laughs> and my ass crack <laughs> I, I, don't, I guess they call you know that you got the farmer's tan so you you apparently had the antelope crawl tan yeah. lying going on it sounds yeah. like <laughs> absolutely so, so at this point i'm like oh and, and like in the middle of all that my phone died because i never put it in airplane mode and i had nothing you know it was like no other service and i'm like holy crap i don't even know what time it is nothing <laughs> so now i gotta go back in the in somewhere in the in the middle of crawling i ditched the sweatshirt because it kept getting hung up on shit so i had to go back find that I found my sweatshirt. At that point, I'm like, screw this. I stripped down to my underwear right there in the middle of this freaking open country. And 
I'm like, if anyone would have seen me, be like, what the hell is that redneck doing out there in his underwear? <laughs> and you tucked all the clothes into your bino yeah. harness, right? <laughs> so, and all I had was my bino harness. <laughs> so I did put my pants back on, but I got rid of my base layers and all that. And but I tucked all my other clothes into the bino harness, this my side loop. So I had like these big balls of shit hanging out each side, and then. I took the decoy, which was, this is the one nice thing about the decoy. It's like an umbrella. I'm like, well, shit. I popped that sucker up like Mary Poppins and put it over. And so I walked out and it ended did up. Did you start singing? <laughs> <laughs> kind of I wondering did. what the tune, tune was you were singing. Uh, well, I, I was too freaking dry to freaking even think about singing. My mouth was, you know, I was parched. But I got out of there and ended up. And, and like I'm walking out, and you know Mary Poppins with the old doe umbrella there, and I did like spook a couple more, a, a nice buck and a doe, and then as I'm walking over the little hill back to the truck to insult the injury, there's a nice buck standing 40 yards from my truck. I mean literally, <laughs> like I'm like what the hell? So I just I literally flipped him off and told him, fuck you. <laughs> If Mark had been with you, he'd have just shot him. Yeah, exactly. He would have <laughs> 40 been, yards, yeah. Yeah, he would have been sitting on the truck, shot him. <laughs> like Put his phone his down. Yeah. Put his phone down and, you know, hold on a second. I got, I got to shoot something. Right. <laughs> so I end up, I get back to the truck. Now it's after 2 o'clock. So whatever time I left, you know, when the sun was coming up. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I had no water no snacks no freaking chapstick and i here's the thing like my wife uses chapstick like she's addicted to the shit and i hate it like but i would have well matter of fact i ended up driving 40 freaking miles to the next town to buy a tube of chapstick <laughs> because the little town that i was in there the, the only thing that they had there was a bar the only that was the only thing open the bar right next to the to the freaking post office. And so then the next town, I look up, I'm like, gas, gas station near me. There was two. I'm like, okay. So I get down to the next town. Well, the gas station that was an actual gas station was closed. And the other one was just like, it didn't even have attendance or anything. It was just, you pull up to the pump, like almost like Sam's Club, and put your card in and fill up. So like no chapstick here i'm like i guess i'm driving to the yeah, next town probably not selling a lot of chapstick out that way <laughs> so so yeah i ended up well i ended up in mile city and at that point you know i'm like i, I did have to like re-download my maps because i didn't uh that's one thing with base map if you're going to download your maps make sure you have the right layers selected because it like goes back to default every time. So go in, pick the right layers. Like I like the topo. I like the satellite view with the topo. Well, and the, you know, when I did it originally download them, I didn't put the topo on there. So that's kind of a pain in the butt, especially out there. It makes a pretty big difference because it looks flat, but it sure the hell ain't flat. Like, and I was like two miles from the truck and it was all downhill. Well, I went all downhill, so on the way back it was all uphill. <laughs> I wish had I had an insult to injury there, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah. No chapstick. Yeah. Grass Sun, burnt. Sunburnt, freaking crack. The antelope kicked your butt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, then I was thinking, holy shit, if I would have killed this poor bastard, he would have been roasted by the time I got him out of here. If we, you know, we probably both would have been dead <laughs> trying to get a whole antelope out without a pack or anything I'm like man that was dumb so I, you know in the heat of the moment i just took off from the truck and wasn't ready you know didn't get any of that it would have been awesome footage and didn't get any of it on the tacticam so i apologize for that part but it was definitely a an adventure i'm sure you know that you got those channels on tv and you know, where people watch the fireplace burning and the snow and i'm sure somebody would have really liked to watch the three hours of crawling <laughs> right. sure some people would have got a lot, a lot of kicks out of that one. yeah what's well, funny is like well i end up the day 
So we ended up at your house like a couple days later, and then we ended up uh, hunting, going for elk. And then we switched spots, and we went for elk in another location. Then we went into town, and on the way back from town, we ended up spotting a couple more antelope. And I'm like, well, screw it. I'm going to go after them. So Mark and Ed dropped me off. Get it. Got a safe face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, all right. So I end up like, I don't know, it was probably close to a mile that I had to run down the ridge and then cut back up and crawled for a while. And that's where I found these look like little sea urchins, but they're in the freaking dirt. <laughs> and man, I didn't know about these. And I'm like, tr- I'm moving fast and all of a sudden, and I just had like my cool pants on. So they're nice and thin and fuck. I put one of those right in my kneecap and it was not, not, and they're like, they're like porcupine quills. They're barbed. You go to pull them out and they stick and then break off. So I don't know what them little bastards are, but they're nasty. So real quick, before you go much further on this one, um, maybe we should get Ed's point of view. Maybe if we, cause you were, you were up above John as he was, stalking in on this antelope right yeah in the second one yeah 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 you could call, you could call it stalking at first <laughs> it was more like he was out for a run with his bow and uh, you know because it, it was a mile or more where from where we dropped him off to to get in there to try to you know get him get where he he could get the right move on him so they didn't see him that's for sure so we're 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 watching him through the the binos that we're in a high spot and, you know, we can see his step-by-step play going on, you know, <laughs> and we're watching the antelope and, you know, for, for most of the time they, they weren't, they had no idea it was there, you know, so it was pretty good. He got in pretty close before they started to think something was up, you know, and then John could take him. <laughs> yeah, well, the whole time we're cheering, we're cheering him on, you know, like, <laughs> oh, no you know like he can hear us you know <laughs> yeah and that's what's so you know like when you're up above looking at that it's like man this looks like flat like how can you even get in close to him well i went like you said i ran down this freaking ridge and i'd pop up and like because i was like i think they're about 500 yards at first well and i'm like counting my steps basically i'm like 500 yards i go up like shit i ain't even close man <laughs> so i go back down run run down the ridge some more and i pop back up and now i'm like i can't can't find him but i'm like i remember that there was like a tree about halfway down and so i'm like well i'm at least halfway so i'm gonna start cutting up so i started cutting up and i couldn't find him i'm like going and we're and we're like no, further, further. <laughs> like you can hear us, you know. <laughs> and so and I'm like cutting across this and I can't find him, can't find him. I'm, I'm like looking up at the truck, like, because Ed and Mark are parked in the truck all the way up, like up this hill, way up above. And I'm like looking at him with the binos, like, give me some kind of signal. Am I on? <laughs> and they probably were, but I couldn't fucking see him. <laughs> you know, I could just see the truck. So. And I'm, at one point, I think I was like waving my arm, but I don't know if they could see me or not. But so I start going, and then finally I catch a glimpse of them. And so, I'm like, all right, but they're still like three hundred, three hundred yards away. So I, but there was like a nice little dip. So I just kind of like I'm crawling, crouch walking, and then as I got closer, that's when I started crawling more, and then I freaking got into them, damn whatever those pricker freaking cactus things were. Holy shit. So then I get, I ended up about, because what they were doing was they'd like bed down and then get up. And then they'd eat and bed down like the doe and then the buck. And it was just a buck and a doe. And finally, I I was about 60 yards. And I was just getting ready to pop the decoy up. And the, the whole time the wind was coming right, like right to me like a cross and like right then it like kind of switched up and started swirling and I like just as I was getting ready to pop the decoy up I picked my head up and looked and all of a sudden that buck had got up and what like came towards me and was looking right at me I'm like oh shit so I popped the decoy up well 
on that decoy, it's got a little rod that you pull out the back of it and you stick it in the ground. Well, that ground is all like rocky. So I'm trying to hammer that thing in, end up punching a hole right through the palm with that freaking that rod and it won't go in the ground. Finally, I get it stuck in. So they're like, then at that point, the doe had run over like, what the hell's going on over here? You know? And they're all spooked up. So they were like over 60 yards at that point. And then they ran out. And they ran out to about 100. And they just stood there. So I'm like, screw this. I ranged them again. It was like 102. And I freaking adjusted my sight. And, I and, level. And, and real quick, what, what were you guys thinking when you were watching this at, at the end, Ed? Well, you know, it's hard to judge yardage from up where we were too. And the whole time, you know, who, who knew these, this buck in the stove, you know, lay down, get up, lay down. It, I can't believe how many times they got up and laid down and ate a little bit, moved over here and moved over there, you know, just kind of gives you a little indication of, you know, what you're hunting. They're not, you know, they're, it doesn't ever seem like they ever got comfortable. You know, they're always like very wary you know skeptical every little blade of grass moving it seemed you know so it was just it was kind of crazy and then how they ran you know like john explained how they ran you know they saw something they just kind of come right over there to see what the heck it is you know and it was it, we we at that point you know we thought oh he's you know he's close enough he's going to get something you know and even at the the 102 yards that he just mentioned it it didn't it didn't look like it was that far from where we were we we're like oh yeah he's got this one you know <laughs> so we we were pretty confident at that moment you know but yeah i let it fly and he just like it was pretty windy and and the, well the here's the thing the tacticam i didn't forget it this time but i turned it on as i was crawling and the battery died like so the only footage i got of that was me crawling <laughs> and so because i went back to look at it after i'd shot and i was like oh it's off it's freaking and i tried to turn it on and it was dead i'm like what do they say if you got one you got none yeah yeah <laughs> two is one one is none yeah well <laughs> i had none my battery died but but yeah i launched one and he kind of stepped and i don't know I, I think i had a couple white hairs on it but and the arrow didn't fly good on that one either, but that's a whole other story. I mean that that there's a lot in there's a lot of time in between the two antelope stories. So we'll go back and finish the, you know the first antelope. So that was my first day. You know that was the Friday, I think it was, or was it Thursday? It was Thursday. Well, I don't remember now. That would have been either was, Friday or Saturday because it was the, Friday. The eleventh Friday was the eleventh because that's when I flew out to Colorado. So, so. I left on Thursday. That yep. is what it was. Yep. I left Thursday, drove out, got up there Friday morning, hunted all day Friday. What was crazy is when I finally got back to the truck and I sat there and I guzzled four waters. I mean, <laughs> looked all through my truck, but I, I knew I didn't have any chapstick. <laughs> and uh we're gonna uh, have listeners sending in chapstick <laughs> oh i bought <laughs> i bought a whole bunch of freaking montana huckleberry chapstick after that so um i'm good on chapstick guys <laughs> but so i'm sitting there and i'm like sprawled out i did have my lawn chair but the only shade was like in the side of my truck so i'm sitting there in the, the shade of my truck and a vehicle pulls up and it's some guy, some guys from Michigan, like, they're like, you seen anything? And I told them what was going on. They're like, really? Well, how'd you find the spot? I'm like, I just picked it on the map. Like, how'd you guys find it? We did the same thing, you know, <laughs> and they ended up there from Traverse City, Michigan. And, uh, I'm like, they're like, do you, do you care? I'm like, dude, I'm done. I'm, my <laughs> dishes are done. I, can you see me? I'm like, I'm sitting here in my, basically my underwear. I had my pants pulled up all the way up to my crotch. So like. Or my, you know, like the, the legs of my pants are pulled up as far as they would go. So that basically had shorts on. I'm sitting in my Crocs and that was it. I got one question for you. Did you tell them where you were from in Michigan? Yeah, I did. Or did you point oh, to your Oh, geez. So you were, 
you were really representing there, huh? <laughs> They're like, yeah. wow, uh, we mm, we were questioning in that area of the state. Now right. we know. <laughs> yeah, you know. Those. I was thinking in my head, like, wow, well, you're showing that picture. Like the only thing that was missing was like the t-shirt with like the bottom of it pulled through the top. You know? No, I just didn't have a t-shirt <laughs> yeah. on. My hair is all crazy. You already like, got the red uh, yeah, tan line like, from your shirt being like, pulled up. What's up with that red stripe on your back, dude? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But they ended <laughs> up parking next to me, and they went and chased. They went and chased them. I don't know. I ended up. That was. I talked to them for a little bit. They took off, and then I didn't see them again after that. Before they left, so. But. Just a well, and then. While I'm sitting there, you know, trying to just recuperate the whole herd of them come up like up the valley and up on the private though and then they're like on the road right right like 130 yards up the road from me just the bucks chasing the doe and she didn't want to cross the fence or go under it and finally she did and then he didn't want to and then then all of a sudden i hear a truck coming and i look and here's like this old beat up chevy truck and he waves i wave to him and he goes over the cattle gate and then he sees the, you know, all the antelope sitting there and he stops. He backs up. He's like, you got an antelope? I'm like, yep. He's like, why well, on this section on this side and this side? He's like, you can hunt all this property you want. Bag them all. <laughs> He's like, I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, fill all your tags. If you, you know, fill as many tags as you can. I'm like, well, I only got one, but thanks. So... But at the, you know, I ended up, I did, I got redressed and, uh, I went after him, I ended up driving back all the way back down and around and going up to where it ended the little, to the Northwest where the, the little trail ended. Cause it ended right at the corner of his property in the BLM. And I walked that up cause what those antelope did then was they followed this drainage all the way to the Northwest up his property. And the problem with that was they were on the the north side of the drainage and i got over there and all i could do is sit and watch them there was no way i was going to get across it the only way i'd do it the only way i could think about getting an opportunity would be go walk all the way back get in a truck drive all the way back and then go all the way to the north side of his property and walk about three miles out across that opening and then cut down and it was just getting too late at that point but when i say it looks flat, like I parked. I'm like, oh, it's just right over there. And I start walking, and all of a sudden, it's like a mini Grand Canyon. Like, like I had a hard time going down and getting back up this this freaking canyon in the middle of this freaking gulch. Yeah, I'm like, what the hell? You know, like mountain climbing this shit. And then I did find... Like, on my way back out, then I, I glass sat there for a while, watched them, and, you know, I'm like, all right, well, it's getting start getting late. I got to figure out where I'm going to buy some chapstick and <laughs> and where I'm going to, you know, make camp. So I start heading back, and all of a sudden I'm walking along, and all of a sudden, well, shit, there's a mule deer shed. First shed, I, I've never found a shed my whole life. I take two steps, there's another shed. The first one was like a little, I don't know a decent four point and then the second one was like a spike and uh i'm like wow that's cool got me a shed a couple of them grab all three of those so they're pretty old but that was a four by four and then this old spike and then this little tiny guy here (laughs) i've never seen a basket eight point that's got to be a white tail this is a whitetail, and yeah. I actually found this in the spot, the second spot we hunted elk, which I didn't, we didn't even realize there was whitetail in that area. So it, look, it looks like a coos deer, freaking, <laughs> it's so tiny. But we'll, we'll put some pictures on the uh, our Instagram. <clears throat> but so I ended up taking off, like I said, ended up down and, Mile ended up staying in a hotel in Mile City that night. Talked to my wife on the phone. She's like, just get a hotel room and get some good sleep. And worked out good because I could re-download all my maps. Actually, 
fell asleep with my phone freaking like stuck to my chest. I was like looking at it and like, oh, 40 minutes to go, 40 minutes to go, and then woke up. Shit. I didn't finish it, so I had to stay there a little longer and get those downloaded. And then uh, got back, ended up driving back up to that spot because Mark had stayed, he was on his way out. So he stayed, uh, I think, in like around Bismarck or somewhere out in North Dakota. And uh, so ended up driving back. He ended up meeting me at that spot. And we just kind of sat there. And like I said, I at that point, I was whooped. Like my calves were free. I mean, I think it was just from going all day without any water. And, and you know, at one point running up the freaking hill after an antelope. And that wasn't the smartest thing to do. But so that was my adventures with the antelope. And then ended up Mark. Mark and I, we took off. We had about a five and a half, six hour drive to Eddie's. Got in there, uh, what was that, Saturday afternoon? Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. It was right after, I ended up having to work on Saturday. Yeah. So, yeah, Saturday we ended up, uh, that was the first time Mark had ever packed his pack. You know, he had just bought it like three days before we left. But, uh, we ended up not highly recommended. No, <laughs> but it seemed to work out for him. It worked out great for Mark. <laughs> yep. Yeah. He did pack out my mule deer in it. So yeah, that's right. He didn't have to pack out his elk since it was like 10 yards off the road. Yeah. But I don't 10 yards. That, that wasn't might even, be a stretch. Right. It wasn't even 10. Uh, but so we got into Eddie's, got everything set and, the one thing is our our number one spot, our A spot, was closed due to fire. So we had to, like, completely regroup and pick the spot Eddie had hunted in the past. And we got over there and we, you know, hiked in, what, almost three miles the first night. We left Sunday. Well, so backing up. <laughs> After the issues with my bow, when we got the ads, I started shooting my bow, and my bow was shooting like crap. It was I was still getting like a spiral, and I did notice. I think for one, crawling around in the, the heat and the sun definitely affected my string. Like must have melted some of the wax out of it or whatever. But like when I drew back on it, it my center serving from the way my D loop is tied, like scrunched up and my knocks were f- super tight. Like I go to pull my arrow off and it pulled a knock out of the arrow. So do you think, and this would be a hundred percent speculation. Um, but do you think that a uh, factory serving factory uh, string would have been better uh, reacted the same way well it was the factory string okay so that was on the pse and i did not have time to build a new string for that boat so that was the full factory set okay and i you know i just put the 70 pound limbs on it the week before which here's the thing i don't recommend that i'm not going to do that shit again i'm not you know it was different with the Hoyt because I was super familiar with the Hoyt. And all I did was put 80-pound limbs on it, and it shot the same, everything. Where I got this bow late, you know, with the whole COVID bullshit going on. I got my NTN late, ended up being 60 pounds. And it was shooting good, but there was still, you know, like I was playing with arrows, playing with arrows, playing with arrows. I had ordered, this, you know, the 70-pound limbs like basically before I ordered the bow, like when I ordered the bow, I'm like, I want a bow with 70 pound limbs. Actually I'd ordered it with 80 pound. Like I want a 60 and 80. And then he's like, well, we can't get it. And then finally I was like, well, just give me a 70 and, and he, uh, 60 ended up coming in. The bow came in and 60. I'm like, well, just order me a set of 70 pounds. And so it took forever to get here. And then I rebuilt the bow, ended up having some other issues. I uh, have 
I'm not sure how, but one of the axles in the bow was bent, and there's no way I can bend this axle, like unless I like dry fired or dropped the bow or <laughs> did something. But these are the biggest axles I've seen in a bow. These are quarter inch axles. So, and I promise you, I did not dry fire the bow or drop it or do anything like that. And I take every time I work on the bow, I drop, take out the four full turns out of the limbs, uh, like they recommend everything. So I don't know if it was just something with the, that got missed or shipping or what, but that was one of the issues. So get to Ed's. I find that the center serving is all bunched up, but there's nothing I can do about it. I don't have a, my serving tool with not, I mean, and that's a pretty big deal to rip the string off and reserve it the day of a hunt so i did put in a new d loop um, and then i brought my lit knocks my nocturnals which with the eastern axis arrows i find that they don't fly as well like if you're paper tuning and bear shaft you can take a factory knock like eastern knock that come on the axis arrows and the fitment is like perfect and it's nice and stiff. When you get to the nocturnals, and I think this is issues, like if you see a lot of people, when they're shooting their nocturnals and the Maxis arrows, the top breaks off. I've seen it several times in Dudley's videos, and I know it's happened in mine several times, even target shooting. There's not very much material in that thin shaft between the battery and the shaft. So I think that has effect with flight. You get some flex there. So like when I'm paper tuned, I definitely don't get as good a paper tune. So then I was like, you know what? Before I took off, I'm like, I'd rather have better aero flight than being able to see the knot. But when I got out there, that knot, the factory Easton knocks were too tight. And that's the one thing about the nocturnals is the throat is a little bit wider. So they have a, they fit. Uh, a bigger center serving so I was getting actually better arrow flight with that it wasn't getting a knock pinch so I switched that up did a couple more things with it and you know got it you know shooting pretty good but the one thing I I think I had mentioned it before we left like I was still my uh, my broadheads and my field tips were not even close like my when I'd shoot my field tips they were like four inches left. If I had, when I sighted my bow in for my broadheads, then my field tips are four inches left at 20 yards, which I've never had that big of an issue. Yeah, when I got to Colorado and shot mine, I was like, I think an inch and a half, like high right at 40. And I was like, well, yeah, that's that, pretty good. Yeah, so, I mean, you could see the arrow the arrow flight with that bow is just, it, there's just something I definitely lost some confidence in it, but maybe I'll be able to get a hold of John Dudley and he can give me some pointers on how to tune it better. <clears throat> but well, they canceled ATA, so yeah, there's going to be plenty of time to chat. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up we we got everything packed up, took off, got to the first spot. And Eddie and I found some really good sign, uh, but there was a lot of hunters. A lot of hunters, no elk. So we ended up that for three days. Never heard of elk, never seen elk. Like I said, though, we've seen a lot of, like, fairly fresh sign, and just that they just got pushed out of there. And, yeah, we had talked to some hunters that, you know, that was the story too. They were, they'd hunted there quite a bit and, you know, it, it seemed like a really good spot cause they actually traveled from what I consider a good place to hunt, right. to hunt there. And they, and they even talked about leaving the area and going somewhere else and hunting and then they end up staying. So we're like, well, they're, you know, right. this is still a good area. And plus all the sign we saw, I mean, they, they, they just must have really have just gotten driven out of there. And it, it's just, you know, it's kind of odd how all the elk could get run out. 
I mean, we covered some ground and we saw some other people in there and they weren't seeing anything either. And a good, another friend of mine and his son were hunting just on the other side of the mountain. So, I mean, we were a place that we were going to probably end up checking out if, if the, you know, if, if the elk were there and, you know, they were reporting to us that they weren't seeing anything either. And they, boy, they covered some ground right. and we did too. And it, it was just, it was really kind of a strange thing. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, and I mean, we could have went in even farther, but you know, there was guys on horses going in, there was a couple of horse camps and they're, you know, obviously they're going in farther, but you know, it, it didn't help. We had our buddy Mark, who he uh, he didn't he was really wasn't up for the the whole tent camping packing in thing. He kind of liked the other spot. He kind of I think Eddie, you kind of spoiled him on this first hunt two years ago when you brought your <laughs> your trailer and he could go back to camp. And he could drink his Budweisers and you know maybe do some <laughs> driving around and maybe have a cold one. You know, while driving or, around. <laughs> or that or go, you know, do some socializing, you know, talk yeah. to everybody in town. You yeah. Know, every camp, stop at every camp and shoot the breeze with them. Yeah. So <laughs> social he, butterfly. That's a social <laughs> butterfly with the lucky horseshoe up his ass. Yeah, that's right. So we, uh, we end up switching locations and it was pretty much, I mean, at first, you know, it was totally different. You know, we, we set up camp and down at the bottom of the mountain in a little, you know, forest service or, you know, state campground. Uh, then we drive up the mountain every day and then just kind of park and go in from there. And you know, for the first, what, four days, it was just nothing but other hunters. Uh, we had guys following us. I mean, we did hear a couple bugles. But between, like, the guys following us thinking we were, you know, actual bulls. And, and here's the thing. My calling is not very good. I mean, uh, <laughs> and for them, like, we would go 100 yards and I'd throw out a location bugle. And then all of a sudden we'd hear them set up behind us cow calling. Like, <laughs> like, you guys really don't realize that I'm just, you know, a person? Like, come on. <laughs> and finally got to the point where I actually ended up doing some turkey calling and then that they finally must have figured it out, like, oh, that is a that's a person. <laughs> but so we did that a couple times and then, then we ended up getting into some bulls. And we put up we the one night we put some bulls to bed basically, or we you know, figured out where they were at. We kind of set up a plan for the next morning, Eddie and I were going to take my truck, park at the bottom of the mountain, and then we put Mark up at the top. We told him, Eddie kind of pointed out where he should go, and uh, that way he didn't have to hike and you know, maybe we push something to him. Well, we got to where we were going. Mark got to where he was supposed to go, and they end up there was a camp set up right there on the old logging road that he was supposed to post up on. So he just he took off down to it was a dead end uh two track old logging road <clears throat> and we thought he was going down yeah we called the crazy bugle spot because the first day we got there we actually ended up at the end of that and we were all just bugling and practicing and making all kinds of racket doing crazy shit so we called it the crazy bugle location we thought that's where mark ended up but actually he ended up like he only went about halfway down. There, there seemed to be some communication breakdown somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so which ended up real lucky for him. <laughs> yeah, it worked out great for Mark. So we we hike up this mountain, you know, and it was it was it was pretty tough. I mean, it was some gnarly shit, steep. Uh, I don't think blow we, down. Yeah, we didn't end up, or we did hear a couple bugles. But we had nothing going, and we just, oh, and we did have, the guys from the camp that day did go down. Yeah, and we thought they were bugling. 
bugling at us and yeah so we end up running into their coffee cups about halfway back up the logging trail yeah they're sitting there on the log <laughs> like yeah and at that point like we might have screwed with what i might have kind of screwed with them a little bit bugle and then we'd walk and i'm like i'm gonna throw a bugle down this way and then see if they're gonna you know realize it's a person or not or if they're gonna chase us but so but we end up walking all the way back up we walked right past their camp and all of a sudden ed gets a text from mark just shot a cow i'm like what like it's like hey so you just shot a cow i'm like what seriously yeah seriously (laughs) what the fuck so So we we put it in kind of high gear yeah it's like well and we start walking down the trail you know like it's quite a ways down there to the end and we're sitting there talking back and forth (laughs) and all of a sudden we get down there a ways and someone's like hey Uh, we look and here's mark he's standing off you know like what 30 yards down in the off the two track yeah and he's he had a, his arrow in his hand, I think, at that point. He's like, yeah, she went right through here. We're like, well, where did you, like, where are you parked? He's like, I was parked right up there by the gate. Well, there's an old, you know, steel gate, and there's a pull-off. And he just pulled off right there. He was, he's like, yeah, I did some calling along the ridge. Well, the ridge, well, calling along the ridge for him was, he just walked down the two track. You know, and was calling over the ridge down into the deep gnarly shit, but he didn't leave the trail. <laughs> and so uh, then he came back and uh, he was on some work calls, he said, and he's like, well, I did, I did have my bow and I had an arrow knot because I had told him, I'm like, whatever you don't, don't even go take a shit without bringing your bow because that's when a freaking elk's going to pop up. And so he said he was sitting there on this tailgate and what he had a work call and then he had just got done texting one of our buddies that live here in Michigan. He's like, this elk hunting fucking sucks. And then all of a sudden, and at some point during there, didn't he say, he's like, I better put my release on. So he put his release on. He, he said he got a funny feeling. I think that yeah. he should put his release on. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So then he's like, he heard a noise coming down the two track. So he like stood up and like, like stepped out off his away from his truck. And he's like, here's a cow coming down the freaking two track. And so he drew back and he's standing there like full draw. But she's like coming. She don't see him or anything. She's coming right down the two track, you know, frontal shot. And then at about 40 yards, she just decides to turn and go to the north side of the two track, which is like and stops in a freaking opening at 40 yards for him. And he freaking... He's like, I put my pins, like, all right in the middle of her body or whatever, right? You know, my 40-yard pin, I think. He's like, I put it right at the top of her shoulder or something. And he's like, I don't know if I, you know, hit her good or not. But we went over and, like, the arrow was. Yeah, all... we, we found where he shot. We found we where he shot. Checked out blood. And the blood started was looking good. at his arrow. Yeah, and his arrow all but like he he had the whole arrow like about three or four inches of the the fletching end was broke off so that was like still in her i'm like well you went all the way through her the arrow broke off you know i mean it's all full of blood and there's good i'm like this is good blood really good blood you know good frothy blood you know and so him and i start like following ed's like well which way did she come from and which which way did she go He's like, well, she came down the two track from that way. And then she was heading back, you know, like this way, which, you know, and so Ed just got back up on the road and he's like, well, she's most likely going to go back the way she came from. Isn't that what you said? Yep. Yep. And, uh, so we, Mark and I are down there. We're, we, you know, we got blood. We're following it. You know, we're just being nice and slow. And all of a sudden Ed whistles, like got blood up here on the road. Right where we had just walked, <laughs> you know, like, and I had walked right over the blood trail, and it was good yeah, blood like crossing good, the road. Yeah, good hunters we were. Yeah. Walked right across the blood trail, crossing the two trail. Right, but we had no idea that we were even that close. Like we were just trying to get back, you know, get down there. And uh, what well, we stood there for a second looking at it, and then you stepped up over the hill, and he's she, 
you're like, well, here she is right here. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a little bit of a mound on the two track and we step over it and there she is, not 10 yards piled up. Yeah. And they're like, holy shit. So. And pretty so, exciting. Ed, pretty exciting. Ed, you've killed elk before. Is that the way that it usually goes? I mean, is that the. Oh, yeah. I mean, you just pretty much, you know, step out of the truck. The more noise you make, the better, it seems, because <laughs> then they're they're pretty sh- sure that it's not a problem to come walking by, usually. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much how I order them up, usually. <laughs> Occasionally, I'd like to put in a little more effort. But... <laughs> yeah, take what you can get, right? Yeah, yep. <laughs> so, we end up, we end up. Eddie and I gutted them out, got her out, got her all cleaned up. Uh, we had some pictures that uh, he ended up like center punching right through the heart, like the golden right. triangle. Couldn't even got any better. Like I'm like that. <laughs> you couldn't have freaking put a hole through the center of the heart better. And so at this point, John, like, how are you feeling? Because you've, I mean, like now we already know that you have this this angst towards Mark because. You know, he didn't put in any of the work. He's just sitting there on the tailgate <laughs> making work phone calls and all this stuff. Yeah, but we love Mark. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying one way or the other, but, you know, he's a, this motherfucker, he just walks out there and shoots him. Well, know? and what's funny is here's the deal, because I don't know if I'd said this to Eddie, but I know I'd said it to Ann, my wife, and I'd said it to another uh, couple guys. I'm like, here's the deal. Mark's going to go out there, and he's going to fucking just, you know, once this going to, uh, what I say, kamikaze. He's just going to run in yeah. and he's going to shoot the motherfucker. And he's like, well, this shit's easy. You know, like, <laughs> what the fuck? And, I mean, and called it. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like your first time now, John, having like your hands on elk and like, uh, we didn't get to this part in the story, but it sounds like you guys just drove the truck over there and lifted it into the truck. Like, so you didn't quarter it up. Oh, pack oh, it there wasn't out even any, any lifting at no, all. Just no. slid it right in. Yeah. So Mark pulled his truck up. He backed it up to that lift in the, in the bank. And right about the time we were getting his truck, well, he had his truck pulled up and we were getting the coolers and stuff. We were getting it situated. Here come another hunter from down the two track and a super cool guy. I wish I could remember his name. And he was like, Ah, I seen you guys had some luck. We're like, yeah. And uh, he's like, cool. And they're like, I think Mark's like, hey, we'll give you a ride back to your truck if you give us a hand loading this. And he's like, well, hell yeah. And so <laughs> the the four of us grab this elk and slide it up and just slide it in whole right in the back of Mark's truck. I mean, literally like two minutes, like boom, boom, and done. And it was like, sweet throw the rest of the crap in the truck and we took off and dropped him off up at his truck and then we uh went down got my truck and uh dropped that off at camp and then we hauled her into town and got her in the meat cooler and we had some lunch and then uh, was that the day when i no because i had my truck that day i was say if one of those days when we had to go into town is when i stock the antelope on the way back yeah but we had i don't i can't remember whose truck we had now yeah, well we had hard marks. to even remember we had yeah. mark's truck because the elk was in his and, oh yeah okay but so i think it was the, like a day before that or something because then after that mark was pretty much done i don't think he ended up going but, into town by himself and getting breakfast and stuff while we were hunting yeah the side note there though yeah it it just same thing um, both places we went, I'll have to say, I, I've, I made comment to several people as I've told about our hunting escapades that I have never seen so many hunters yeah. out. It, it just was kind of mind blowing. And then in this same place that I, we hunted there two years before and we pretty much had the whole place to ourselves and a, kind of the same time period stretch and everything, you know, we were there for quite a while and it, it was pretty amazing I, I couldn't couldn't even believe how many hunters were like somebody sent out a message that, you know <laughs> to right. all hunters this is where you needed to be it was crazy 
Yeah, and it was grizzly country too. So I mean, yeah, you know, there's a lot of grizzly country, but that was one of the factors. We're like, well, really don't want to go hunt. I really am not excited about going to hunt grizzly country, but maybe there'll be less hunters there. Nope. It, no, that was not. A, I mean, we seen guys out there in the freaking mountain, like up there in the hills, in fucking soft tents. It, you know, camping, like. Uh, do you guys realize this is grizzly country or not? Like I took a picture of the sign where and right as soon as you pull into the little campground that we're in, it, it has a picture of grizzly bears and it says, welcome to bear country. Like, and this is what you need to do. <laughs> this is the protocols. You know, they're warning you, Hey, this is real. You know, it's not, uh, not just for, you know, fun and games. There's a, a real issue here with bears. Well, now what I was getting at though, with that, like, you know, so you, that was your first experience, like getting your hands on elk, et cetera. So how did you feel like, were you like reinvigorated? Like, oh man, now, you know, now, now the focus is on me. Now we don't have to worry about Mark because he's <laughs> well, like, that was, you know, like, like, um, there's elk in the area, you know, what's your thought process at that point? I think actually I'm like, I, I, I was super excited. Mark killed. I mean, it was, it, it was cool how it happened too. Cause like I said, he had hiked with us a couple more times up until that point, but that was like, actually the last day he hiked with us, we, we had got, it was, it was like raining, a thunderstorm and then it hailed and lightning. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was pretty gnarly and it was some, it was some pretty like treacherous terrain. Like, and like, we're walking in, we walked in and we started walking in like basically at gray light, just as it started getting, you know, it was still pretty dark or, you know, not very light out. Uh, but so we're going in and we get up into these spots and we, we did, that was like, we had a couple out going, we had a couple bugles we had heard. Um, but then Ed was like, you know, he had hunt, hunted that basin before. And so he's like, I think we need to go down. So we go down this pretty steep stuff and we get down to the bottom. He's like, ah, I made a mistake. I forgot about this one section where that's really steep that it's hard to navigate through. We need to go back up. <laughs> and Mark's like, what? Oops. What, the, what are we <laughs> fucking doing? Like, and it's like, well, big deal. We just got to go back up and we'll get back up there on that old last logging road or whatever it was and just walk that again. And so we get up there and then we get up and it opens up and there's some real nice little meadows or parks, whatever you want to call them. And, but the elk that had been in there, if they had been there, which there had been a couple, but they're already through that, you know, you're not going to call them back. And Mark's like, why don't we just set up here? (laughs) Like, (laughs) like, well, we can, but it looks great, but we're not going to, they're, they're gone. They're not coming back to this maybe tonight, you know? Uh, but so we, we went a little farther, and at one point, we had stopped at, like, I don't know, something. We took our packs off, or Mark took his pack off, and he took his binder. He, he overdressed. Off. I oh, think yeah. he overdressed. Yeah, he was <laughs> shedding a couple layers or something. Well, then he put his pack back on, and he forgot to put his harness on, so they had to take his pack back off and put his harness. He's like, fuck this. I'm going back to the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And he's like, I'm going straight up the hill. <laughs> I'm going to go straight up that. It's like, well, there was some pretty gnarly rock up there. Like when we were coming up, we could see it. And he said he got up in there and it had a real funky smell. He's like, it looked like bear country. And so he's like, I end up coming back down to the trail and just walk back out to the, <laughs> to the truck on the trail. And he ended up hitchhiking a ride with those local, these local kids in this little Isuzu and we'd actually, we had seen him the day before coming up there. Like we're going up this and here I'm driving my brand new truck up this gnarly mountain road. And it's just beating the hell out of it. It's so dusty. Like you step out of the truck and it's like talcum powder. This dust is so fine. And this little, like, we're going up to one morning on this little freaking, I'm like, what the hell? These guys are just like on my ass. I get over, they're like, and 
It was they like wave this, as they go yeah, by. Like, <laughs> and this thing was just a mountain hunting rig. It was like this little Isuzu thing. It didn't even have a like the back window was a piece of plywood, like just <laughs> dusty as you know. All get out, this <laughs> gone. Well, Mark ended up waving a ride from those guys that morning after he like was like, "I'm done with this shit. I'm going back to camp. I'm gonna hitchhike." <laughs> And uh, he hops a ride with those guys and no back seat. Like he's just bouncing around and he's like, there's some bloody ass water and an old cooler with no lid on it and back seat or where there was a back seat. Uh, but ended up being some really cool dudes. But you're like, yeah, we heard people down in there and blah, blah, blah. And, but uh, so that was Mark. Mark was pretty much done hiking at that point. So when, you know, that like the next day, then that's why we had told him, well, if you don't want to hike, you know, we're going to go up and maybe, we'll, you know, you'll get a shot and it ended up working out and it worked out, you know, like he just ended up parking in the right spot at the right time and it worked out great for him. Um, and the funny part about it is that after hunting that area a few more days, it's like he couldn't have been in a better spot. Right. He couldn't have pulled off and parked in a better spot. Like everything below him, just after hiking down in there and hunting those down below where he parked, it just led right to where he was parked, you know? Yeah. <laughs> just the, the, the elk liked it. The easiest way out of that drainage, you know what I mean? It just right. couldn't have been any better. Yeah. It and was then, crazy. And all the other, like, what happened was, so, like, all the elk that were in those other drains that we started hunting pretty much had got pushed down into this one. It was kind of like a little, little bit of an overlooked spot. And uh, so it was like a, it did give me some, like, confidence, like, well, you know, okay, Mark killed an elk, so there are elk in here. And that made us push a little bit harder to go find, you know, find them. And so I think it was, it might even been that night when we, we got in on them down in there at the crazy bugle spot. Uh, we yeah. ended up getting down in there, uh, seeing two bulls, one like herd bull and they were bugling like crazy. At one point I actually had them coming up, but they were, you know, like when I, when I put them in the range finder, it was like 240 or 250. So they were ways, way down in there, but the way it was kind of opened up, there was no, we were as far as we could go in the cover. And yeah, they, and we were, we had some good cover from them. And then I'm, I'm kind of standing behind you as we're oh, figuring right. out what to do. And I was like, John, there's some, there's a cow yep. that's staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> and she laid down. And I can't move. Yeah, and she laid down just staring at us. Yeah. She was up on a little bit of a bench above us. I couldn't have been any better just to watch us, what we're doing. I'm like, shit, what are we going to do? Got yeah. these bulls coming up. Yeah. If they come up and we try to move around and make some moves and to blow that cow out of here, you know, and they're going to get worried and whatever. <laughs> she just had us pinned down. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it ended up being a cow and a calf, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, and then... Because so they then... ended up getting up and meandering off but right so we had those two up to the right of us were about 70 yards or 80 yards or so and then the the bulls were down below us just and he must have had a hot cow because he was just bugling and the other guys were bugling and he i could see him just going back and forth and circling back and forth but then finally they kind of like worked their way up like kind of to the I, i say northwest but i've but they were off to my left and then heading away. So they headed up that drainage. So at that point we we're like, well, shoot, you know, it's starting to get dark. Let's just go up and get up kind of where Mark had parked and sit up there yep. above that and listen for them and just see, you know, where they're headed. And, you know, so we got up there and sure enough, we just listened to him bugle well, right below us. We ended up here in cow call. Well, when we were coming up the two track, there was a little four wheeler parked that wasn't there on our way in. So, like, hmm. well, then the the uh, it's 
you know, dark at this point. <clears throat> and then he stopped calling, and all pretty soon we heard the four wheeler start up, and he come up, and we were just parked right in the middle of the two track. So he pulled up, and he recognized the truck. It ended up being the kid that gave Mark the ride. And he had seen my truck, you know, from being at camp or uh, the day before when he passed us, Mark had told him. So he knew my truck. And he's like, hey, where's your buddy? And I'm like, well, old Lucky Horseshoe, he shot a cow and he was, you know. So we told him the whole story. And he was a super nice guy, like local yeah. kid. And he's like, well, you know, he's like, did you hear him bugle? I'm like, yeah, well, we seen him. I'm like, there was two of them. He's like, no, there was three. And, uh. He's like, you guys plan on hunting this in the morning? I'm like, well, we were planning on That's why we were trying to, like, you know, get a locale on them and where to start. And he's like, all right, well, I was going to take tomorrow off work and hunt in here. And he's like, but if you guys are going to be in here, I'll, you know, I'll leave it alone. And he asked us how long we were going to be there and blah, blah, blah. So he's like, hey, I'm not that kind of hunter or whatever. And so, which was awesome. You don't normally see that. No, and he, he kind of was pretty... <clears throat> Cause he knew I'd hunted in there before too. And so he was like, you know, just you guys, you know, you've hunted in here before. So, you know, you know, yeah. so he, he was real cool. He's like, have at it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Super cool guy. So we ended up down the next morning. We pretty much did the same thing. Of course, Mark that night, when we got back to camp, <clears throat> he had got, he went over like our little, state forest campground was right next to a, a private campground that had big trailers and shit and he had been over there several times you know in the prior day finding new friends and <laughs> found some friends from north carolina and from virginia and stuff like that some good old boys and so we get back and here comes mark's headlight through the freaking woods and he had been over there drinking some uh Maker's Mark or whatever, and his Budweisers, and having a good time with those guys hooping it up. And we're like, "Well, you gotta get up early, buddy." He's like, "What?" And they're like, "Yeah, you're gonna go up and you're gonna park at the top again, just to make sure no one else, you know, to let people know that someone's hunting there." You know, I guess we we're kind of doing a little block, but I don't know if that's ethical or not. But so Eddie and I. Went in from the bottom again. Uh, Mark ended up sleeping in his truck that night. Drove all the way up there in his sleeping bag. Never even got out of his sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> Just parked. <laughs> and uh, Eddie and I took off. And we uh, we had set a route to like where we had heard those you know bulls bugling. And shoot we could hear him bugling like we never even made a noise oh and we God. heard him bugling they were going nuts it was, excuse me it was like non-stop must have been all night so we got into them right away and they were up on top of the mountain like on this like plateau and it was real thick and gnarly like to get to them and there was the the herd bull and then there was like a satellite to the right and then the satellite to the left and then i started calling and then the night before, I had take I had taken the Tacticam, and I was trying to look at some of the footage, but then I was charging it. Well, in the meantime, so I put it in the Tacticam that wasn't on my bow. Well, I forgot to take the the memory card out and put it back in the one for my bow. So I got out there, and I'm like trying to turn the Tacticam on, and it's like, boot, 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 like no card, dummy, like. So I did have the GoPro with me. So I pull the GoPro out, I pull the card out of the GoPro, I put it in a Tacticam. In the heat of the moment, I just set the tac or the, the GoPro next to me. Well, I'm calling. I mean, and I'm bugling and they're answering and screaming back and forth, and I'm all excited, like, man, this is gonna happen. Well, they they weren't budging. So Eddie's then set up behind me and he's calling, so I'm gonna start working up the mountain trying to get up to him, kind of pull a Paul Medell, get up there, try to sound like a cow coming in. And it, it kind of works. Well, at, I'm still yeah. back there acting like a bull and like I got cows and making yeah, and, a lot of noise and raking trees. and Yeah, kind of like I was the <clears> cow <throat> that got pulled away from you going to the other herd bull, you know. And it was working until I got up there and then they started working away. And I was like, well, that kind of sucks. So 
But then at that point, I'm like, oh, son of a bitch. I left the freaking GoPro down the bottom. And you know, I'm like, and this isn't just like a little hill. You just walk back down to get your freaking shit. Like, this, I'm like, oh, I guess I'll have to come back. I tried calling Ed, but we have no service out there, you know, or texting Ed. And finally, he gets up to the top where I was at. And I'm like, did you happen to grab the GoPro? And he's like, no. no. What? What GoPro? <laughs> I didn't see no it GoPro. must be with my wind, wind checking and He's like, power yeah. Cause... <laughs> I lost a bottle of wind checker down there, too. So <laughs> if Pick you go that back, up when you get your camera. <laughs> right, if you go back down there, find you, go find my bottle of wind checker. So we ended up, we uh, kind of followed them for a while. And then they like we lost them or they shut up and we so we ended up getting all the way back up to Mark to the crazy bugle spot. <laughs> At that point, we're like, Well, I told these guys, I'm like, Well, I gotta go back and get the GoPro, so I'm just gonna walk back from here. It's easier to walk back down than it is to come up that nasty shit. So <clears throat> I start walking out, walk, they hop in the truck, take off. I'm like, I'll see you guys about an hour and a half. <clears throat> I start walking down. I get down there, you know, a little ways, and I see a grouse. And I already told this part on the base, the map. base map. But that's when I seen the grouse and end up shooting that one, freaking lost the arrow, did the whole line of sight thing with, and measured it out and shot. I end up killing the grouse and, then I went after my arrow, and then I ended up shooting the, the mule deer. And even with the mule deer, that's, you know, like, I don't know if I got into it much, but, you know, I was pretty calm with the mule deer. I'm like, this wasn't like a big buck. It was just a doe. I was just filling the tag, meat in the freezer, and I was calm. And, you know, I knew the yardage, 35 yards. I drew back, and I put my pins, you know, 20, you know, my 30, 40 pins right there, and squeeze it off and that arrow did the same freaking like half corkscrew like and hit her on the right like right behind the last rib and i was like son of a bitch and i i forgive me i forgot to turn the tactic cam on at that point well like it happened so fast and i was trying to like limit my movements because the two were watching me and then when she pumped jumped out she started looking my way you know, so she knew something was up. So I didn't want to be sitting there trying to turn the tech cam on and doing all that. Well, yeah, I mean, so like that buck that I killed, you know, I'm, I'm editing the video now. And like, I, so I'm af- afraid. Uh, it's, not a, it's not actually a fear, but like, I don't trust the fucking remotes. Because I've tried for so many years, like with the GoPros that I had. Like, I know when you hit that button, like. You, maybe it goes on, maybe it doesn't. I like that, like the right. the tactile thing. But like, I've got a GoPro on me, like looking down, and I've got the Tacticam wide on my head, mm-hmm. and I'm uh, Ernie got tagged out, so he returned the camera, you know, and right. so I was gonna use it. Well. I, it took, it was, I, I was looking at like the countdown timer. It was like 10 seconds. I was fumble fucking around trying to, because I couldn't find the thing, you know, this buck, you know, great buck for Michigan's walking in and I'm fucking dicking around trying to turn on the camera, you know, I'm like, well, I'll, I'll get it on one of these goddamn things, you know, right. like I just abandoned it. So I can, I can see what you're saying. I mean, it's really easy to turn on, but at the same time, it's like, is it worth losing the animal? Over it? Yeah. You and know. after, you know. Yeah, and so I shot, and I, I watched the arrow. You know, I'm using, I'm I'm still using the lit knocks, and I just see it. You know, it's right exactly in line with the, you know, where I was aimed, but it was, like, back and to the right. Like, fuck. And so, I mean, I knew it was a fatal hit. I, it, she was quartering away pretty good. And so I just sat down, I just listened. I could hear her. she took off, and then uh, I ended up finally going down. I found some blood stuff, whatever. Like I said, we already told the story. I ended up back down to my truck. We came back up, got back down in that area, 
and then Mark and I were like following blood and Eddie was out doing his magical circle things and he's like, Which way? Like how 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 far was it between the last blood trail or the last spot where she laid down and the next blood spot? And I'm like, fifty yards. All right. And it wasn't what, two minutes. He's like, I got her. <laughs> <laughs> She's fifty yards from the last blood spot right down here. <laughs> like, Thanks, Ed. <laughs> yeah. Got it. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> so we uh we hurried up and I didn't even I think I did do like a a little uh interview, but I mean, like I said, we're in Grizz country. She had already been dead for a couple hours as a gut shot. So there's got some smells in the air. It was warm out and she was starting to puff up already. She was dead. Like she was stiff. So she died right away. It just wasn't the kind of kill I like. Um, I'd rather seen her go down or had her be dead within that first few minutes. But so we, we got her skinned out, quartered out packed up and packed out of there and you know by that time i had already you know went up the mountain once down the mountain down the mountain and then back up. down to her and then packed back up packed her out you know i think i ended up i had both the front quarters and then a bunch of the burger meat and then each of you guys grabbed a hind quarter i think is what it was and so then, like, I was pretty beat. And so we were back at the truck. Mark ended up taking off and uh, got her packed in the cooler. And we're sitting there and like, well, what are we going to do, Ed? We're we going to hunt. He's like, yeah, we'll just take it easy. We'll just, like, we'll just kind of stay in the same elevation and just kind of take it easy tonight. Like, all right, good, because I'm a little bit tired. Nope, we walked. Uh, straight up the freaking mountain <laughs> up into the gnarly <laughs> shit i'm like hey ed uh this isn't like the same ele- well we'll be on the same elevation now <laughs> and uh, we did we got one bugling up top there and he was down in like the next drainage and so we were kind of like parallel him. <clears throat> and at one point we thought maybe he was going to come through the saddle up there and it was real rocky and gnarly up in there kind of kind of freaky looking like like what I would picture like bear dens or bear country, you know, like, <laughs> Oh yeah, for sure. Like there's some, <laughs> some dark cavey looking places, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, what? I don't really want to go in that dark uh, area right there. Uh, <laughs> and I don't want to see anything come out of it at me either. Especially after I'd listened to the freaking meat eater. Uh, uh, oh, which one was it? Like, Meat tree face off or something like that, <laughs> or no face, where the dude got his face ripped off by the grizzly up in Alaska and the sun freaking oh. shot. Yeah, that's not good, not I, good bedtime stories when you're hunting. No, not when you're heading out in the grizzly country <laughs> for yeah. the first time. <laughs> so, so that shit's going through my head. I'm tired, but we end up we end up going all the way out to the end of this this point and then. Ed's like, well, John, go down there. I'm like, holy shit, this is steep as fuck. <laughs> so I make my way down and get out on this little point in this, like, park. And uh, end up, I'm sitting there, like, because we figured that that bull, we had lost, you know, we'd lost, he we got a ear shot from us, but he might have been circling down. And it was steep and thick, so could have easily, you know, not hurt him. Like, maybe he was going to circle around that point, and he ended up, kind of going back up to the left, like that was where we had seen the herd bull the the night before, like down there in that little freaking drainage. So I'm sitting there. I actually sat down. I'm like, almost fell asleep. I was like almost going to lay down. And then shortly after I heard some stuff snap and I look over and about 120, 130 yards to my left, I see the ass of a, out going through end up being a cow and then a then a calf and then the freaking spike and the spike had about i swear he had about 20 inch freaking 24 inch freaking spikes they look like kind of like devil spikes coming up like kind of gnarly looking but he's not a legal bull there 
But so, and they're heading back up that way. So I get up and I said, they're quite a ways away. So I get up and I start walking my way over. And it was kind of like the situation we had in, in Idaho, like get in front of that bush right there. Well, I get over to this bush and it's freaking a wallow, like a water feature. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't really like a, the wallow that we had seen there, but it was nice, real wet spot. And then it had, it was the beginning of a drainage and the water was trickling down the hill and down. And uh, <clears throat> so I get over towards that and all of a sudden I hear a bugle right in front of me up over that hill, up in that thick stuff. And so I'm like, creeping closer and closer and all of a sudden I see him coming I see his horns coming but he's like there's a hill in between us I'm on one side of the hill he's on the other so I can see his horns coming but I couldn't see like his body but then he's coming closer closer and closer so he's and then he like cuts through this opening I can see his full body at that point but and I had ranged the tree like this pine tree that he his horns were coming across and it was 54 yards to the pine tree so I'm figuring he was about 50 and he walked down and then, but there was no shot for me. <clears throat> so he's going from my, my left to right. So I start going back kind of the way I came to circle around this big freaking pine tree. And as soon as I like get over there, I look and there's two more pine trees, like 18 yards in front of me. And there's the cow and the calf, like standing there, like they were drinking the water. Like they had come up and shot right up to that spot. And they had heard me, but they couldn't really see me. Like, so I'm like peeking at around the tree and they're like looking my way, trying to figure out. And they, they didn't like bark or anything. They just turned and just started like walking, like the way that that bull had come from. So I'm like, shit. And then the bull is like down below him. Like, and I heard, he was like, kind of like raking a tree or something, like breaking branches. He was doing some shit down there. So I start going back to the left again. And all of a sudden, sure enough, he comes out. And like I said, he's on the other side and like he's standing there and then like he stops and like looks towards me. But all I can see is like the top of his back and his horns. Nice bull, at least a five by five. I think he was a six by six. Real dark, dark horns, white polished tips. Just a real nice rack. And I'm like, I probably could have launched an arrow. And it probably would have been like the perfect arc just to like go. It would have been like a tack shot. Like it would have been over the hill. and But I could, it'd be me looking at his vitals through the hill, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. and I wasn't comfortable with that. Well, and that's like the shot that I could have taken in Idaho where it was like shooting through a basketball 40 yards on a 60 yard shot, you know, just put it right, right through there. And so. He was like stood there for a minute, and I'd like crouched down. At this point, I'd switched to my silverback release too, because I, you know, like I said, I'd basically I, two or three bad shots or not good arrow flight, something going on. Yeah, so I'm like I said, and I'm not making any excuses. I when it end up coming up to this, the bull shot, I was like completely amped and like. I mean, but there's a lot of factors going through my head. And I think, and I had even like on a couple of them grouse, because I shot like, I shot five or six grouse, killed two. And I was feeling the target panic, like back to the days when I was at the range and all of a sudden just, just because I like my pins on, I got to get it out away, you know, now. (laughs) And I had felt that. And so that bull ended up, he kind of kept going and I was like crouched down and creeping and get, trying to get closer and closer. And I started kind of e- easing up that side of the hill or my side of the hill. And he had kept on walking towards them cows and then was pretty much like going straight away from me. At that point, I was like, I'm going to give him a cow call. Maybe he'll turn and stop. And then I could just stand up and I would have had a clear shot over it. I got, and it still would have been about 50 yards because we're just like pretty much, you know, moving at the same pace. And I hit the cow call and went, meow, meow. And that sucker like turned his head as he freaking started to gallop, <laughs> like bolted. And at that point, I was like, okay, 
of the whole time we were here, I have not heard a real cow call once. We've heard a bunch of bugles. The the bulls were being very vocal, but the cows were completely tight lipped. So that told me right there, you know, and he had not seen me. You know, he had heard noises over there, like, but he didn't didn't see me. You know, wasn't worried about you, right? Not, didn't wind you or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, the wind was perfect. Yeah. You know, and so and there had been a cow already there, so that's why I was thinking, well, shit, I'm just gonna cow call him to get him to stop and. But so I'm like, you know what? Forget the cow call. I'm not going to mess with that again. So we set up a plan the next morning. We're going to come back in there. I think that's what happened. We ended up coming back in there. Didn't see anything. Ended up sticking around there all day. Like just kind of hung out. Or no, we did go back to camp. Because Mark left that day. I think it was. Mark left that afternoon or the day before. But, so, anyway, back up there the next evening. Ed goes down, like, below the the ridge, back kind of, like, towards where Mark had killed the cow. I went back out to the point, and at this point, I'm like, I'm, I brought my cow, or the, the decoy out, the cow elk, elk decoy, I set her up like right on the top of that mound and I'm like probably, well, I was 25 yards from the little water feature going down the hill and I found like a nice pine tree. There's a nice pine tree right on the like, top of that and then with some junipers in front of it. So I kind of cut a couple limbs out of it, and made myself like a little cubby in there and I've just got sat down on my stool my bow is sitting there next to me, and I'm like, just got a t-shirt on. Like I'm getting ready to put my camo on, and all of a sudden I hear a bugle like up the ridge towards where Eddie's at. But it was quite a ways, and I was like, I better knock an arrow, you know. So I knock an arrow, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I hear another bugle closer. I'm like, holy crap. Then I turn the freaking camera on. And I hear coming up. Well, here comes a cow and she comes right up on the other side of that water feature. And I like range. I range through the opening and it says like 49 yards. But that's like through this opening to the where there's like a freaking dead tree fall over there. And I can hear the elk. He's down here. All of a sudden he does like a little bit of a crazy bugle. Just a little short one. And all of a sudden I can see his horns coming up so i draw back at that point and i'm knelt down and i'm like behind this juniper bush but i can i'm watching him and he comes up and as soon as he starts to get out you know coming to that opening i slowly just raise up and he was like walking quartering away like picture perfect the only thing was that when he stopped his front leg was kind of back like covering his vitals if you want you know for a perfect shot but I wasn't even thinking at that at that point. I'm like, oh my god, this is. I mean, it's gonna happen. And I put my pins. I like line them up right behind that front leg. And I swear, I put like my 40 yard pin like right mid body. So it's like everything's covered at that point. And I freaking just went to mush and just. <laughs> jammed it and and you you had already said that you'd switch to your silverback but this in the haste yeah in the yeah in the middle of that like when all, <clears throat> i mean everything happened so fast the silverback was in the left side of my thing and i just reached in and grabbed my knock to it and quick clipped it on and so i honestly don't know if it would have mattered i mean because it was everything was just so like fast and hectic, like, but I watched the arrow go right through the top of his back, like right through no man's land. And I was pretty much ready to puke. Like I might even shed a tear at that point. Like, and, 
And you're working on that video, so you you got that from the Tacticam because you said you spun around and you had an arrow pointed at your head <laughs> talking to the Tacticam. So I'm like, yeah, I knock another arrow and then I like like kind of walk over. I'm like, yeah, and I go to do a a video like a interview and I've got the arrow on the bow and it's like pointing right at my forehead and I'm like, I just had my opportunity and I completely effed it up. Like, and I'm like, F, 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 F. So we might have to bleep that out. But it, it wasn't, it, it just, no excuses, man. I've been, never been so excited in my life. <laughs> but it just. John is a virgin all over again. You know, after, yeah, I definitely forced <laughs> Gump on that one. But I, I no, can't. man. <laughs> You know, like with the turkeys and all that, it's just like, you know, I'm, I could, I sat there at full draw forever, you know, just waiting for the shot and to squeeze it off. And, and it's exciting, but the way everything had built up to this point with this bull, and that was the first bull I ever pulled back on, you know, or first elk ever. I was definitely, you can't prepare for that. The only thing you can do is make sure that you have 100% confidence in your equipment and shoot every day and hope that you're, it works out. <laughs> but it didn't work out. I know I like wanted to see the arrow going through him, and I did. I watched it go through him. I went right through the top of his back, and I went down and found my arrow. And it was just some fat and some meat, no blood at all. I looked all around. You know, I could see his tracks where he left. On when he took off, I heard him bugle down the freaking mountain. Like, I just heard him bugle. Like, he chased that cow, like, was bugling at her still. So, like. And to, to, you know, if you're, you know, listening to this and you're thinking, oh, my God. And, like, you know, so John's got all of this emotion and, you know, whatever. Like. We're not even to the bad part yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, te he texts me, you know, like I'm the biggest clown there is, you know, I just <laughs> effing missed, messed up. And I, you know, I just a whole bunch of other negative stuff, you know, <laughs> that, <clears throat> you know, everybody goes through when something like that happens. But, you know. I'm like, oh, geez, I better get, I better, <laughs> you know, figure this out here, you know, and I'm, I don't even know, you know, a mile away or more or somewhere, you know, work in some other area. And so, yeah, it was, it's pretty, he was pretty, pretty uh, wound up, bent up about it for sure. Yeah, that was one of the worst walks I've had back to the truck by myself, just going just repl i mean you know even i mean i it took me 30 hours to get home and i don't think there was a minute that went by that i wasn't replaying that in my fucking head the whole whole ride home i mean just how did that happen so so in all that time in all that reflection in all that that everything i mean what would you do differently and the in the in the in the reason that i ask in the, in like all that because you know i've not you know messed up on an elk or you know whatever but i just can't, i can you know everybody's missed deer or, or hit them bad or animals or, or or whatever and i you know i go back to like you know oh yeah it's world's worst bow hunter all of this stuff but like you know my the year that i killed that big one and like the 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 reason that i took that shot is because i messed up on the one earlier in the year and i didn't take the shot that i you know, was comfortable making and everything. So I use that, you know, and it, and it all, you know, worked out, but you I know, think it was still bad for one. Well, it just, it ended up working out where I, my first shot was at a nice bull. Like he was a nice bull. You've seen a picture of it. If he had double brows, he was a six by six. If he didn't, it was a five by five. Nice high rack, wasn't super wide, but a damn nice bull. Like, and so like when we talk about people going out and getting your feet wet or getting a couple under your belt, 
or you know like or we talk about guys wanting to go out and kill their first bo- you know monster buck and you got to you're going to have some screw ups well i i didn't ha- i don't have it comes down to experience for one like Dan Infall says the time to kill 150 inch deer that you know to draw back on isn't the first isn't time the first time you right know. exactly and so that was part of it number 1 though is definitely having I, like I said, I'd lost, lost confidence in my equipment at that point. And so I was second guessing and doubting, and that ended up leading to some trigger panic. And I'm not making excuses. I'm putting it out there like I should have just brought my, I should have just said, okay, I'm not, I'm not dealing with the, the PSC. I want to bring it out there. I want to shoot it. I wanted to promote it and do all this. I should have just picked up the Hoyt and from the from the get go, because I know how that boat shoots, and I know how it performs, and I have a hundred percent confidence in that. I mean, for one, it's you know the bow we brought, I bought to Idaho, you know, and I did screw around with it the week or two before we went out there and everything, but I had I had already had a bunch of time under that bow before. All I did is switch limbs you know what everything that was going on with this bow i should have just said you know what next year you know maybe white tail season or something so you know we ask everybody you know what bow they have and and like i said i i I joke about it and i talked about it with you know joe retmeister a little bit we've gone back and forth with a couple of different guys but you know, I feel like the guys that are like super successful, and this isn't like a jab at you or like whatever, but like they're like, I can shoot my fucking bow at 20 yards, and I know they don't know like their thread count and their, you know, or like what material the string's made of, like whatever, but they know, you know, that that bow's going to kill something at, at, at whatever. Now, do you think that like having that much knowledge is like, almost a detriment like in this case so like when you now you have more things to second guess like the average guy's like well it's got to be my sight or my rest or something you know not like <laughs> you yeah. know well that's like i was saying i've never had issues i've never not been able to get my bow tuned to the point where my broadheads and my field tips are super close especially at 20 yards like unless you're shooting like mechanicals or something I mean, that was like one of the fixes for mechanicals was like you didn't have to be that great of a bow tuner to get your bow, shoot, you know, your mechanicals shooting close because they fly a lot like your field tips, you know. But we're out there and I'm shooting fixed blade broadheads and they're not hitting like they should. And I'm getting this like corkscrewing effect and I did everything. I shim the cams, I you know, everything that's physically possible. Okay, so I'm shooting... The PSE NTN, you know, John Dudley's edition, the, you know, Evo cams. And the only way to get around the tuning on it is either shim the cams or like now that, now that I got back, I'm building a new string for it. I did end up flip-flopping the limbs, like from left to right. Uh, I went through all that, made sure everything was clean and there was no other issues and it's just, I have all the confidence in the world in my Hoyt. And it's just an old RX-1. I mean, it's loud. You know, it makes a fucking loud ass every time like the, all the other ones do. But I can tune it. And I can get everything, you know. So that's what happened. So after, well, let's get back to the elk. So I shot the elk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can the, answer your question, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I shot that elk high in the back. And <clears throat> so yeah, we we're texting back and forth. And when I looked at my text actually from the on the inreach, Eddie's like, just seen the big boy, he's kinda heading your way or something. And and, and that was like ten minutes before I had seen, you know, like I didn't see those messages because <laughs> the shit yeah. that was going on. I was getting ready and then all of a sudden I'm, you know, flinging arrows. But so we get out of there, we come back, make a plan. We're going to come back in the morning. 
We're going to sit there till 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and then we're going to, you know, do our due diligence and look for this bull. Maybe by some luck I hit an artery or something and killed it. Uh, so we sit, and we notice some birds down off the, the mountain. And so I think what we sit till like 11, Ed? Yeah, yeah, 11 o'clock. And uh, we get up, and Ed had marked, you know, he's like, he had noticed some more birds, like, over to, like, towards his direction, like, off to our right. And so he had, like, pinned a spot where he had kind of located them. And then, like, all right, well, I'm going to head down towards these birds here. So I walk off the edge of the mountain, come back up, like, this mound. As I'm coming up this, like, call it a mountain but it's like just a foothill mountain i'm coming up that edge and i can start seeing down the next valley like where them birds are kind of circling and as i'm coming up and i'm cresting the top of this hill i can see down in and I, there's a bald eagle i mean it was like how cool is that this bald eagle sitting on top of this dead tree like that's freaking crazy and as i'm cresting over the top farther i can see down down and right underneath the bald eagle and this dead tree there's a bull elk laying there dead and i'm like holy shit i killed him like he's like that's like the way he went and you know it was all downhill and so i'm like like trying to get ed's attention i'm like whistling or waving or whatever and i'm like waving him down he finally looks at me i'm waving him down and i like start freaking running down this hill like a dumbass, like we're in grizzly country. This animal's been dead for at least almost a day, you know, like, uh, hey, hello, use some common sense. So I'm like, I better slow down and get my gun out. <laughs> so I slow down and get my gun out and I'm walking up, you know, I'm like, all right. And I'm like talking and making some noise. And then Ed comes down and he gets his gun out. And so we get up there and I'm like checking this bull out. And it looks a lot like the bull that I shot like same color it wasn't it had like the same colored horns and stuff and from what i can remember it happened so fast i'm like man that's him you know but we start looking for the arrow hole i'm like we couldn't find it like what the hell so we end up i'm like we end up rolling him over like maybe the exit side there i'm like there's no holes i'm like what the hell do we do like he seems like, he, you know, like he hasn't been, it's not like he's been dead for a super long time, like rotten or anything. Like there was no stink, really nothing. It was just a dead animal. So I'm like, well, I'm going to like at least skin him back up there. So I, maybe I can't see it, you know, just hoping that I couldn't see the freaking arrow hole through him. Like, yeah. Uh, but. So I end up skinning this whole bowl, like all the way down. And I don't know what the ethics of this or what, you know, what you're supposed to do, or if I was even supposed to do that with a bull or animal that's, I didn't kill, but I was well, trying to find out. At this point in time though, we're not even sure. Right. And that's what I'm, we're look. you know, we're just looking for a wound, looking yeah. for a hole, looking for, you know, maybe it still is the bull you shot. I mean, it, it's it just unsure. So, right. you, you know, you don't know. So you, you're still at this point thinking it's the one you shot. Right. So we're looking for this kill shot here, you know, this. And right. Maybe I was like, Oh, maybe I'm, maybe I hit him, you know, down a little lower than I thought, you know what I mean? And so I end up, we end up skinning this bull all the way down around his neck and, front like there was the only thing that we found was his throat like the whole his whole throat was just black like his esophagus like it was like crushed or something like it was bruised black and blue like just smashed bloodshot yeah all just swollen up and so i don't know if he had gotten a fight and got his throat smashed or broke neck broke but there was there was one little spot like that I didn't get to on like his lower it would have been left shoulder or brisket, like down low in that front that could have had an arrow wound or some kind of wound in it. But at that point Not in any vital area. I mean right. it just was 
it was just really odd. So I went from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs, like, oh my God, I got, I found him, we killed him, to the freaking kicking the balls again to the lowest lows. Like, we just found a dead elk and it's not yours. And it wasn't 400, what was it, like 370 some yards three yep. from where I'd shot. And so, like, <clears throat> what are the odds of that? I'm like, and not like it was rotten, like it's been laying there for a couple of days. Like we probably could have easily tagged it and taken it. I mean, the meat was still, I mean, maybe once you got down by the, you know, the hind quarters, it was souring, but for like the back straps and everything, like I put my, I cut into it a little bit and it was like fine. Yeah. So it's crazy. So at that point I was pretty much, we were done. Like I told Eddie, I'm, you know, we're good. Like, I don't think we even hunted that afternoon. Did we? Well, I can't really remember. I don't think we did. I know we, Oh well, yeah. I think I remember it. Maybe I went out to the end of that point or something. Oh, or yeah. I, that might've been the next. That was that night. Cause I walked out to the end and sat up on the log piles, just kind of reflecting on everything. And uh, the next day we packed it up. And so, Ed, what were your thoughts on that? I mean, like, that seems like the most odd, random, like, something that doesn't happen, right? Well, it's funny you say that because that, that's what I, you know, it, it just, it was so weird, that bull being down there. But it did have some blood on its horns. And we were like, well, that's weird, you know, because we looked this thing over pretty hard. And, um, so, you know, as we wrap that up and I've told that story to a few people, I'm before I even got done, like part way through the story, I'd say halfway through, they're like, Oh, it probably got in a fight, broke its neck. And I'm like, well, I've never, you know, run into that ever. So a couple different people, I mean, that was their thought, you know, uh, before I even got my story finished. So I was like, wow, that's weird. Because I'd, I'd, I'd never even heard that, you know, any story like that before, you know, where somebody found an elk and, you know, and probably had a broken neck or, you know, had gotten in a fight. But, and then a few more times I heard that after I told the story to people, you know. So it, apparently, you know, there's some, it's, it's a fairly common thought process anyway. When somebody runs across that, whether or not that's actually what happened or not, but it seemed clearly seemed that that to us, as much as we did trying to figure out what happened to that bull, that's all we could come up with. Yeah. Cause he sure looked healthy. You know, that would be the only thing that, you know, we like, could figure out. Like, it wasn't like an, it was old age or something, you know? Right. And when you, like I'd put my knee into his, like on his chest cavity or, and you could hear like the air coming in and out of his throat. Like, like there was no holes in him, <laughs> like where in the know, body, yeah. in the body, like you do that. If there's any kind of hole in the chest cavity or anywhere, you're going to get some gurgling or bubbles. It's going to blow yeah. something out. There was nothing. Like I said, I skinned it down all the way down. Yeah. And there was no, no blood on the ground under it or anything like that. The birds did eat one of his eyeballs out. I mean, but I mean, how hard is that? <laughs> you know, I mean, that wouldn't take him very long. So, but yeah, that was, that was a pretty tough moment. I mean, really doing, going through all that. But I mean, overall, I wouldn't, I mean, I would change it if I could. I would take <laughs> the bull home, but. I'd still, you know, I, uh, I had a great, great time hunting with Ed. Like, there is a, I mean, we, I guess we kind of pushed ourselves a little bit or we'd push each other, but Ed is a whole nother animal when it comes to the mountains. Like, I would just be joking, like, you know, kind of screwing with Mark. Like, are we going, we, I remember at the one point we were like, we had already hiked up this nasty spot and this is in the first area we hunted and we got up here to the top and it was like 
are we going to go to the left or right? Or are we going to go up? And I was like joking, saying, are we going to go up? And it was steep, gnarly, just shh, bullshit. And Ed's like, well, yeah, we're going up. <laughs> I was like, that tree right there? He's like, yep, that tree right there. I'm like, all right. And, and Mark's back there like, are you fucking serious? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> at, I, at one point in time, Mark's like, I'm just the third wheel here. You know, because <laughs> John and I are like, let's go up this mountain. Let's keep going, you know, because <clears throat> I don't know. I'm I'm always one. I want to see what's over the next ridge, you know, because that, that's where it is. It's just like you, you're, you, the those highs and lows that John talked about earlier. I mean, that's the highs and lows of your hunt of the day. It's like you go all day and you don't see anything. You're like, push yourself to that, go over that next ridge or to that next drainage and then bam, you're into like the honey hole, you know, and I, down in Colorado, I, I feel like I was in an earlier part of my life and I don't know, somehow magically there was more time then. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't seem like I have as much time now, but man, I was like, I have probably a solid 10 places to hunt there, you know? And, and it's, it's because of that, like go over the next ridge you know, there's no elk here, but sure, then you have to go to where you can find them and go on that extra mile. You, you know, you find stuff. And I think we did, might have been that day is when we found the like the, the party wallow. Oh, yeah. I mean, it just looked like there'd been a herd of elk in it, you know. So going that far, we found, you know, some area, we didn't see any elk there, but, you know, we got those places marked on our, you know on our gps and stuff so it's you know that's a possible place to go hunt again i know where there's a Just, nice scent lock coat up there too yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, yeah we got all the way Mark. up there and uh <laughs> we end up like we got all the way up to this gnarly ass ridge and then cut across this stuff and we're just getting ready to call again and all of a sudden, I thought I heard voices. Then I heard a whistle. And then look down, and here comes two guys up the mountain from the other side. And so I don't know if they had heard me calling up in that drainage before that, and they were working their way up, you know. And so at that point, we're like, well, might as well have a snack, you know. <laughs> I sat down <laughs> on the log. Eddie sat down. Mark takes his pack off. He's like, I didn't bring no snacks. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's looking through his pack in the meantime he takes his coat off and he's wearing scent lock which I mean it looked like it was I mean it was a pretty heavy coat but so I don't know if he if it was had been in his pack it was in his pack is what it was he it was it, in his pack he, he pulled it out looking for something yeah he pulled it out <laughs> looking for a snack didn't have no snacks I gave him some beef jerky and uh, we finished that up and then we take off. We get down. Exploring. To, yeah. <laughs> we take off. And, man, that's when we found that party wall and that some bitch was, that was like just some mega sign. It stunk in there. It was super steep going down there. The, the, the hillside, we were just torn up from out going oh. in and out of there. Yeah, it was, I mean, and then there was like another wallow down below that. Just really awesome territory sign. But like I said, they just got pushed out to me, hunters, right there. But so we get down to camp and Mark's like, you got to be shitting me. Because it was cold that night and he was looking for yep. his coat. He's like, <laughs> I left my coat on the top of that mountain. <laughs> I'm like, well, you, want, you want to head back you up again? Run back up there. <laughs> right? He's like, fuck that coat. Someone, fuck that someone's coat. gonna find it. <laughs> it ain't gonna be me. <laughs> I know what log it's laying on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, that was, was funny. But, but yeah, so that was you know, hunting with Ed, hunting with Mark. It was an adventure. I did go get some, uh, that last day, then we picked, packed up camp. Um, I went over onto the, the nearby river where like a bazillion 
uh, float boats and fly fishermen. You know, like every day we'd see a hundred of those guys. And, uh, you know, redneck Twin Laker, I got out the old spinning rod and a little Rapala floater and, and snagged a couple trout. So end up getting a nice little rainbow and a nice brown. <clears throat> and I released them, guys. I didn't I didn't keep them for you fly fishermen. But, <laughs> but, uh, it was pretty pretty cool though. A couple of, you're like, I think there's a fish right under that tree and one cast on there, boom, yeah. <laughs> pulls out a big old brown, you know. Yeah. It was sweet. <laughs> so So I when we got back to Ed's, I still had a couple more days. And what I did, though, was I had to, um, Ed had to go back to work on Sunday. I ended up, uh, I had to process my deer. And then I took my freaking bow and cause I just had a single pin on my, on the Hoyt. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to do it right, I'm going to do it right. So I took the multi, excuse me, sight off the. PSE, put it back on the Hoyt, went through, completely readjusted the pins, put a new sight tape on it, got it all tuned in, shooting from, you know, 20 to 60, actually with the new tape, all the way out to 100. So I'm like, good to go. I freaking threw the PSE in the Bronx box and locked that sucker up. And my plan was to take off up into the, the Bridger Mountain range for a few days and by the time I got done packing everything or you know taking care of everything working on the bow Eddie was back from work and he's like you plan on going up there yet tonight I'm like yeah he's like well Kimmy's making dinner for you know three of us <laughs> why don't you just stay tonight and go up early in the morning I'm like that sounds good so end up eating dinner but I did run up there I tried getting up there to spot the elk before uh, it was dark, too dark. I got up there and it was too dark to spot him. But I went up, checked the trailhead. There was one vehicle at the trailhead. So I came back, got up like, I think it was 3.30 or I took off the house, took off about four and started heading up the mountain in the dark. And it was cold, like it was freezing cold. Like there was, well, it snowed for one. So there was snow up on the top. And my plan was to go up this one, the trailhead, go up the one trailhead and then circle over to the next canyon and come back down. Cause that canyon actually went down into some private. So it was I don't know, about a five mile hike up in and around. But my plan was to go be able to like looking at the map and everything. I'm like, I'm going to try to get down and then go back up over the mountain, come back down because I know that there's like a herd of elk that hang out on the back side of this private. And, but after I got up in there and I packed heavy, like I packed for three days, three days worth of food. I had to pack in my extra like heavy uh, um, coats and stuff. Cause I'm like, I only have a 30 degree bag and it was like 27 degrees that night. I packed well, in. Well, and this pack in was like the antithesis of where you started your trip, where it was like a hundred degrees, and you're, you know, walking around in your underwear. Yeah. Because <laughs> you set up on your walk in. On my walk in, you know, I started out in my sweatshirt, but I'm like, I know I'm gonna start sweating, so I, I, I don't know, probably forty minutes or so of that, and then I just took the sweatshirt off and went with just my ultralight the u uh, fucking ua heat heat gear whatever just super light t-shirt and i started walking up and it was so cold that my right arm like froze like all of a sudden at one point like my hand my right hand wasn't working i'm like what the and I felt my arm, and it was like, holy shit, it's froze. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't even, like, tell because I'm like, I had, my pack was over 60 pounds. I know it for sure because I had all the same shit that, it, you know, my camp gear, all that. Plus, I had my heavy coat. I had extra base layers in there. 
Then I had Eddie's huge freaking spotting scope. I had that heavy ass uh, tripod. tripod. I had the elk decoy and two liters of water in my bladder. Plus I had my Nalgene bottle filled plus my pistol. And it was a son of a bitch. I got up, you know, for the first two miles, I think it's just kind of like, it's just steady uphill. And then you get to switch backs and then it's switch back, switch back, switch back. Then you got up to the next trailhead or the trail where there was a, uh, the main trail that cut across, get up to that T. And then at that point I was in the snow and like the ground was frozen and it was just switch backs and just gnarly shit. And I finally got up and over. And at one point on the way up, I had stopped. I'm like, like when my arm was froze, I'd stopped up and found a little sunny spot and I made coffee and breakfast. <clears throat> we're going to warm back up, uh, warm that arm back up. Anyway. And then <clears throat> took back off. But so finally I get over into the other, this other Canyon and I'm like, holy shit. I started seeing some old sign, you know, everything was just old sign up in there. And then I was looking around to possibly camp. And then I started going farther down, like, I'm like, okay, I want to get down there. But it was like a few miles. I got to one point where the map definitely didn't do it justice. Like it was steep and fucking <laughs> gnarly. Like there's no way I was going to go down it with my camp on. So I was either going to have to camp right there at this point, which there was still snow on the ground and shit, or just leave my camp there. You know, like call Ed, Hey, come get me. You know, <laughs> at one point I thought about like, I'm just going to walk. I'll just walk out the bottom onto someone's private next stupid. And be like, yeah, I'm, I'm lost. Help me. You know, <laughs> My, all my shit died, and I don't don't know how to get out of here. Sorry. <clears throat> Call my friend. He'll come pick me up. But, uh, so no. But I started, I just sat down. I looked for a spot where I could camp. I'm like, no. I sat there, and I was glassing, and I'm, like, looking at where I'd planned to, like, cross this ridge, or which was not even a ridge. It's just a fucking mountain. Like, mountain you, range yeah i'm not you're not gonna climb up that and go over it and go back down the other side and kill an elk and then come back up and over again like nope not unless you have a helicopter dude because <laughs> this is a mountain range it's not just a hill so i sat there for probably i don't know an hour or two just like figuring it all out reflecting yeah reflecting like everything like well this is kind of my penance or whatever for not getting it done and you know possibly wounding an elk and but uh i ended up like well i made the decision to just head back so now do you think like okay so there's a, a bazillion things factors in play right there right um because you were you know we, we've talked about this with you know, filming and out of state hunts and everything like where you've got like this super enthusiastic start. And then as things like kind of take a turn or like go to shit or it's not what you expected, etc. you know, you start to get down and it makes it less, uh, fun. You know, there's definitely type two fun. Do you think if you would have started there or you would have come to the same realization and then, the other side of that is that you were solo. And so, you know, being in such big country, you know, by yourself. Um, and then, you know, when you're, uh, you know, I've heard Aaron Snyder talk about it a lot. You know, he's like, you know, these guys that talk about, Oh, going in the back country and blah, blah, blah. He's like, when you go in and you're seven days in by yourself and the only you're stuck with your thoughts and you're thinking about some, this fight you got in in middle school or like you know whatever like all your fucking inner demons are you know there do you think it would be different if you had somebody else there or and if the timing was different in the in the trip i think oh yeah i would have pushed him <laughs> let's go over there <laughs> yeah. let's go yeah he'd be like yeah we could do that sure 
Um, no, I think it, I was I was excited to go in there. Like I was really excited to go in there because I know that there's some there's a whole big herd of elk, and if the plan would have worked out, but I think I would have had to. I would have ended up coming to the same realization. Like it was, there was no elk. Like there was old sign and stuff. I found an old wallow and stuff like that, but they just weren't there, you know, not this time. And so maybe I could have, you know, I might've spent another day going down farther into that drainage. But like I said, there was no way I was, my plan on, you know, google earth and all that was like i could go up and over that well everybody probably could have gone up and over that that's why the elk are there because you know if if it looked like that on paper but in real life it was not something that's going to happen um so i would end up with the same conclusion like i probably you know i might as if it wasn't been so would have been so cold i might have spent the night up there and then just you know dinked around the next day instead of doing because by the time i was done i ended up coming out and almost got ran over by some a bunch of mountain bikers uh because they used the other trail like all the college kids got out of whatever they were doing like off their couch and like hey let's go mountain biking (laughs) so they all you know there was literally a dozen mountain bikers i ran into and the first one first one's coming back down the hill damn near ran me over like we were like inches from him hitting me uh <clears throat> the second guy coming down the, the first two were in a group but the second guy by himself now he had the right da- idea he had a freaking bell on his bike and i could hear that some bitch coming for quite a way i was like ding 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 i'm like oh here comes here he comes so i just stepped <laughs> off the trail and he was like as he was like whizzing by me he was like thanks man <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm like, hey, uh, that dude was cool, but but no, the rest of them were pretty cool too. But I uh, end up doing ten point one miles, and it was it said I did fifty six hundred feet of elevation gain, and it was like, I mean, from I don't know how many hours. I did get back in time to the truck. Oh, I did run into a, a guy that was like jogging or hiking with his dog. He was running the mountain, kind of like Cameron Haynes style. And uh, he he come running back and he's like, he stops and he's like, do you need some help, man? Do you need me to take something for you? I'm like, no, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. No, I have to serve my penance here. Yeah. I have to finish my trip to the truck. Like, well, at, least for, at least we're pretty close to the, the trucks now. I'm like, yeah. but And I was like, do you run this often? He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, do you see any elk? He's like, I never see elk, but I see a lot of elk sign. And I'm like, yeah, well. I'm like, I wasn't hunting this side. I was hunting over here. And he's like, yeah, that's why I figured where all the elk would be. And I'm like, yeah, they they used to be there. Or they, you know, they, they're in there, but not right now. They have been in there. So I hurry up, get back, you know, get all my shit unloaded in the truck. I get out to the road, go drive down towards that private where I can see back up in where I was planning on trying to get to. And... Even with my naked eye, I could see a whole freaking herd of elk coming out of the fucking woods, the wood line up there. But when I started looking at it closer, you know, during the daylight, the wood line, most of it is on the private. But the top section of it is on the public land. And so I get out, that's monster spot and scope. And I get the tactic cam, you know, the spotter. The LR spotter, yeah. I get that put on there. And I can see him in it. And I was trying to hit record, but I'm like, I guess I didn't, like, read the directions. And I couldn't get the camera to record. So then I'm, I'm like, I downloaded the app, but I never, like, synced, the synced or, like, got them connected. And I'm so I'm trying to, like, do this. And then end up freezing up the camera then i'm like having to redo that then i end up freezing up the phone and i'm like getting frustrated now it's dark like and so i never did get film of this herd but it was there were over 100 elk 
but now they're all on the private, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like, so I did get to see them and they were there, but the only other way to do it would be like to like climb up the edge of that drainage where I parked and side hill all those for three or four miles down to that private. And it's like, I don't know if you could do it. I mean, maybe. Well, and that's, it's funny that you say that because we did the same thing in Colorado. We went up to this spot where we looked and, you know, you go, you drive up through this basin, you know, and then once you get kind of like nearing the top, then the public spreads out all along, but below is all these green fields, you know, and, uh, Joey was telling us, you know, that's the same, same deal. You know, the elk come down into those, those meadows and stuff in the evening. And on the map, it looks like one thing. And then you get up there and like the one side is like walk in only, but there's horses. So, and then they've got, you know, hitching posts and water troughs and everything right at the thing. So, and there's a freaking outfitter right across the other side of the trail. And so you know that they're, you know, so, you, so you're going to have to find that, you know, that sweet spot in there where the horses are going further and the walking guys don't want to go. Right. But then on the other side, there's ATV trails up above the, the outfitter. But when you looked at the map of the, you know, Frank was talking about how hairy the trails were, where they were at. It was like all these switchbacks with sheer cliffs, like on either side. And it's like, you got to be some sort of freaking maniac to drive a fucking four-wheeler up that and it was so steep so like in my mind that's kind of, that's kind of like the area like i'm picturing because it was just like you know my god even on a, a four-wheeler up there would be you know like crazy to try to do that side healing you know you get up the trail but for uh, any extended period of time like three i was trying to think like three miles of side healing whew, Oh, well, yeah. And then even like where I walked up and I crossed over to the next canyon, that trail, that, that main trail that this, the, the one I walked up on tees into is actually a dirt bike or a single, you know, dirt bike trail. And it's like, and that's what was made it really gnarly because they were up there. Like, I don't know how, like I've rode dirt bikes my whole life, but I don't know how the hell you'd ride a dirt bike up that like those switchbacks and there was steep and rutted and rocks and roots and it's like you'd be off the bike more than you'd be on it i think <laughs> i mean unless those were like some trials riders you know <laughs> like those guys that can you know balance one wheel and ride from post to post uh it's some crazy shit so i don't know how those dirt bikes even got up that mountain but then when i came back and it was melting that was gnarly, slipping and sliding through that. And so that was basically the the sun setting of the yep of the trip. Yep. Then I uh, so the next day I took about I don't know three four hours. Went to the car wash and spent about thirty dollars. Well, I went to two different car washes and vacuums and bought some Armor All and tried to at least clean up the truck a little bit. <laughs> Then I went and visited Ed. Ed was uh, doing his uh, artwork on his on the horses. You still there, Ed? Oh yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Look, I'm just here. no, I'm scouting my next hunt. You know? <laughs> 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 I go hunt. You know? <laughs> and, and, and so for for you, Ed, for for us and for the the listeners and and everything, where. Um, what would you do differently next year? So John says he's going to do the same thing next year. Um, you know, how, how would you uh, manipulate this hunt or what would you do differently um, and, and and why? Well, like I, <clears throat> I got pretty, I'll just say I lost. It's hard to say, you know, I used to define my life. Yeah. Oh, I hunt, and then I do other stuff. Well, that kind of went away for a while, yeah, near, you know, like probably seven, eight years. 
And my wife, you know, I tell, talk to my wife about it, and she's like, "Yeah, you know, you should just don't don't worry so much about it. You know, it'll that passion will come back." So, it, and it did. It, it did a, a little bit a couple years ago when Mark came out. Another friend, John, he, you know, and it kind of just rekindled a little bit. But then I don't know, you get busy with life, and then when John and Mark decided to come out, you know, I kind of got fired up about it. Like, oh, I'm getting new bow, new equipment, do some scouting and then you know you get back out in the mountains and you get back rolling and you just get fuel, fueled up again and so that i'm getting to that answering your question is like i'm i'm fired up like i'm you know like i said new target i got a new bow this year i'm really i'm pretty excited you know and and you know i've i'm bound and determined to find you know get these 10 spots under my belt like 10 spots I can go hunt. You know, if there's not elk here, they're not fired up here. We're going to go over here. We're going to go over here. So putting in the time to, to find those areas, you know, um, getting those, those spots under your belt. So you, you have them there as backups, you know, you got a couple good spots. You go find and you go scout out a newer spot or two for, you know, the next year. Like I, I always consider the first part of the season, just kind of shaking your gear out and maybe check a new spot out knowing that you're going to go to your honey hole, you know, but then you might find new honey hole in the early season. So to change it up is like, I'm fired up. I want to, you know, I'm the passion's coming back and I want to bomb to term and find good spots for us to hunt, you know, and that that's the way it was before, you know, and I put, I put some solid time in this year, you know, and it just turned out we had a fire and it, you know, it just didn't turn out and it is too bad because put a lot of time into one area and, and, uh, it didn't turn out, but it not, it's still there all that time I put in, you know, it'll be good for maybe late rifle or, you know, next year. So I got that spot and a couple more spots sorted out and I'm bound to turn to find uh, my goal is to really find a spot to hunt. I'm sure it's everybody's, you know, where you can just hunt a little less molested elk. You know, you're really hunting. You know, maybe it's not, you know, John and I talked about, maybe it's not the place where the biggest bulls are or the most elk, but it's somewhere you can hunt and just have maybe a more quiet hunting experience where you're really truly hunting and not dealing with so much pressured elk, you know. So, you know putting the word out, looking for that, you know, talking to people I know and trying to figure some things out for a better hunt situation, you know, better experience. So that's, that's kind of how I'd like to make it different for the next hunt. All right. Yeah. Another thing you, um, I haven't been able to put mine out yet, but you bought the new Tacticam reveal cameras, trail cams. Oh yeah, and uh, I know you had the one out. Have you got? You ended up buying like four, didn't you? Three of them. I got three of them. Three. I haven't put the other two out. Um, we talked about it. Um, my wife and I talked about putting them out different places, but I I just haven't got it done yet, and it's still doable. I mean, you can, you know, set it up with your solar charger, and it's there year round, so you can get it. You know, get. <clears throat> that's something, you know, it's, that's a brand new thing to my scouting techniques this year. And it is exciting when you put a trail camera up and you got stuff coming in that fires you up even more. You're like, all right. Yeah. You know, like this was a good. Firemen and moose. <laughs> yeah. Firemen, moose, elk. Uh, the elk finally came back, John. I didn't, I didn't tell you that, but um, I think, well, I don't know. So what is today? The fourteenth, probably oof, within a week. Um, yeah, there's elk rolling through moose. I get two different bulls, moose in there now, and yeah, so it's it's like kind of coming back to getting back to normal now. I think that the people are out of there and stuff. Yeah. So that that that's fired me up. That's gave me you know, it makes you excited. Oh, got a new. I got a new picture coming in, you know, it's a bleach across the screen. You check it out. Oh yeah. Sweet. You know, kind of get you just amped up, yeah. but 
but I know, you know, we, I, I just touch on a couple things too about that, that target panic or buck fever and stuff like that. I remember having it a lot with deer, but then it got past a certain point, you know, and, and then it was just a lot easier, but man, elk, it's a whole different thing when that big elk's coming, walking up. You know, I had a good friend of mine, um, 10 years ago, I, um, called the bull in. It was, came in seven yards away and, uh, and, and then he didn't shoot it. And, and, you know, after it's all done, go down like, what the heck's going on? He says, I couldn't even lift my bow up. <laughs> my arms were like noodles. So, I mean, it, it's some real shit, <laughs> you know, it, it's just the elk are a whole different thing. They're huge, man. They're, it's just so intimidating. Oh man. It, it, it it's hard to explain. Especially it, when, it's a whole nother level. Especially when you, the first thing you see is the big old rat coming through the fricking, like just busting through the shit. It's like, holy yeah. fuck, this is really ha- Like he's right there. And that bull ended up being 33 yards basically from where, like, cause when I went down and stood in his tracks and I ranged the tree that I was sitting in front of, the tree was 35. So I wasn't, I wasn't the tree, you know, mm-hmm. so I figured probably 33 yards or 34, you know, 33 to 34. Yeah, when you see him the first time, it's like, holy shit, that's, oh, just, that's a big so animal. <laughs> that, that target panic and stuff like that, it, it's, it's a real thing that everybody gets. And when I, like, I, I had it and I've shot all the back tension releases. Well, I wouldn't say all of them, but I, I settled in on some Stanislavski's and, and I got a Carter and stuff. And those are old school stuff. I mean, there's so much newer shit out there. But, you know, I had I had to dig deep to to get better at competition, you know. And, you know, it's it it's not a crazy thing, but it's just not something we deal with on a regular basis. Is You know, it's more you got to go into like meditative state. You know, I read books and practiced things about the Zen and the art of archery, you know, just trying to focus, put your focus on different things. And that helped a ton for my target shooting and hunting. So it's, you know, that people need to think about. Yeah. Cause you, you can't get, you, you feel strong and you want to fit yourself, but I mean, you get, you might have to look for some help to get past it. Cause it, it's hard. It's a, it's going to haunt you. You got to get past it and figure out a new, a new focus, you know, to, to, to better your hunt for the next year. So it's, it's just real. I mean, those, <laughs> it's elk, it, they're intimidating when they're that close, <laughs> yeah, you know, for sure. Yeah. So the one question I always ask our guests, what bow are you shooting now? And what, what, what's your setup? Oh man, I'm shooting a Matthews. I chose Matthews and it's that new, I always forget what it is. You know what it is, the V. VXR. VXR, the 31 and a half. Um, I did read a bunch of reviews and I went with it because I just, Matthews been around a long time and they've just been, I've, I've seen them and people will shoot them and do well, you know, and I've had other experience with other bow companies and, and they haven't shot well for me. And, and so it, it fits more my style of shooting. So, and I like it and I've got a black gold sight on it and I got a, there's a, there's some new stuff, the drop away rests. I mean, I've never shot those. I mean, it sounds crazy, right? I've just, I whisk, whisker biscuit, man. That's my go-to. You know, I love that thing. I mean, you, you can't tune those things to, to for nothing. But man, the confidence, you know, Adam, you talked about the confidence in your equipment. You, you know, I just had confidence in my old equipment. And it's a funny thing. I ordered this new bow and it wasn't coming in. So I was shooting my old bow right up to two weeks before we left, you know, before the hunting trip started. And I was almost like, I should just take my old bow because I love that thing, you know. It's slow molasses, but it's, you know, I've killed some stuff with it. So, but. 
you know, I just went ahead and went with the new one. I'm going to, I'm switching over and that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to get good at you. So, and I like it. It's nice. It's shorter. It's, it's quieter. It's faster. It's less weight. You know, I'm, I'm liking it. It's really nice. You know, I, you know, I shoot it. I'm shooting, I think probably right around 65 pounds, not anything crazy. Uh, 450 grain arrow, 125 grain um, monotech, you know, fixed blade, broad edge, just solid rock, you know, just trusty, good, good stuff, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just excited. I'm just excited to get back shooting. You know, it's 22 years since I got a new bow. It's a long time. <laughs> That's a long so, time. <laughs> yep. Pretty happy with the bow. John can't go 22 months. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> hey. You want to talk about, feel good about your equipment, shoot that thing for 20 years. You'll feel real good about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm like my 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 Hoyt is you know that's over two years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Two I years, look at, yeah. Look at this, Matthew's here. Yeah, that one's uh, pushing twenty. Yeah, but yeah, Good since bow. you got a new bow, oh yeah. <laughs> it's been How many bows have you had since then? A couple months. A lot. <laughs> A lot. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, well, it sounds like, you know, you had a, a great trip and a great hunt. I mean, lots of, lots of action. Well, I have yeah, to give they're... it to Ed because, I mean, like I said, he, he put like me and Mark up front. Like he is 100% selfless and he was like, I, the main goal is you you guys get a shot or get a, get an animal. But, you know, he took off two weeks worth of work basically and to uh, go hunting and he never even drew his bow back. Well, take that back. He did shoot at a grouse. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to thank you for that, Ed. You know. Oh yeah. I mean, I had a good time. It was fantastic just getting out. You know, you're out in the. That's part part of the thing about hunting, and any hunting. You know, you're out in the woods, wild wilderness. You're out off the beaten path. You're experiencing things that no, you know, a lot of people don't get to experience. You know, it's pretty pretty lucky. So you know, it it I just felt good being out. And, you know, just taking in everything we saw every day, you know, you can't even, the pictures can't even, uh, you know, say how much, you, you know, what you took in, you know, how beautiful it was. And so, it, you know, it's pretty fulfilling. It is soul recharging, you know, you could say. Oh, yeah. It's pretty, pretty good stuff. Just good experiences. Lots just stuff people don't see every day. They and they're not relating to it. You know, it's like getting back to the core of things. Getting back to the earth. You know, where we're supposed to be. Instead, we get caught up in the world. You know, in the direction it's headed. You, know, you get back. You get out hunting. You get back to the soul and the, the earth and you know humanity, at where it's supposed to be. You know? Right. Well, I'm looking forward to be the guy sitting on the the tailgate, maybe 2022, you know. <laughs> so, so, but uh, you know, just just keep that in mind when John's making these plans. Uh, oh yeah, uh, as long as there's a spot on the tailgate for me, I'm I'm in. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I I just I'm trying to also you know figure that work thing out where I can get back to where I had more or had time, you know, or made more time to be hunting, um, you know, made it more of a priority because it, it meant a lot and it's, you know, it's coming back where it means more and I can get out there more. And then, so yeah, I'm, I'm game. I'm, I just <laughs> like getting out there and getting these solid spots nailed down. So it's, you know, more of a, you know, more of a sure thing is sure thing hunting 
can be, you know, <laughs> just you know, more opportunities. Right. Right. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I think oh, yeah, we hopefully didn't, hopefully people have stuck it out this long. I mean, it's been a pretty long one. I mean, a lot of, a lot of me talking. And, uh, <laughs> they'll tune in for that. Yeah, I hope so. <clears throat> so, oh, yeah. Yeah, they never get to hear your voice <laughs> before. <laughs> right. Well, I was, out, I was gone for three weeks, you know, hanging out with you. And I don't know how many podcasts Adam did, but I know there was a couple in there without me. I think I only missed one week. Yeah. Yeah. But, so. so, all right. Well, we to cool. wrap it up. Thanks for talking, Ed. All right. You guys have a good one. Appreciate yeah. you having me on. Good. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and, you know, poking fun at John. He kind of gets old to me. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I try to take it easy. I don't want to. Maybe I should get well. Oh, poke more fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Cool. Shoot straight, man. Yep. Right. You too. All right. Bye. Sit down. Sit down.